What's up, Internet? We are here with part two of my collection video here in February, my birth month, so it's, it's pretty special to me, but uh, I think it's important that we go with a pretty special console. We're going with my number two favorite console of all time, the Super Nintendo slash Super Famicom. I love this thing a lot. Don't have a lot of Super Nintendo games, but I got a lot of Super Famicom stuff. Uh, a couple things to note before we do this. First, I have got my camera set to manual focus, not autofocus. Let me know how this looks, and if you like this better, we'll, we'll try and stick to this from now on, but uh, we'll see after this is all done. Number two is that this might seem a little bit choppier than the previous video, and that is because my NES Famicom stuff, that took two days to record, uh, just, just this photo stuff with my camera, and that was two rows of games on my shelf. I have a few more of these, and in fact I've got like seven rows of stuff on the shelf, and well, NES Famicom stuff are significantly thinner so I can put more stuff per row, it's, uh, it's, it's not significant in difference. So this is going to take quite a while, and I'm just going to adjust the light a little bit because that shadow I don't like too much. Uh, anyway, uh, before we begin, I've got a bit of a story with my history with the Super NES because I never actually owned one initially. Back in the day, I had a Sega Genesis, and as you know, my family kind of hated games. So I didn't get many games, in fact I only had two, and they were both stolen, unfortunately. However, after kindergarten, I'd go to a friend of my mom's house, and uh, their house wasn't super family friendly or anything, but she went and got a Super Nintendo just for giving me something to do, and she'd constantly rent me games all the time, it was super, super nice of her. Unfortunately, she moved, and when she did, it was very sad because I liked her a lot, she gave me her Super Nintendo, which was huge for me. Except the one game she had, which was Super Mario World, she lost. So I had a Super Nintendo, probably, uh, maybe a little bit after the N64 came out, but I had no games for it because the N64 came out and no one was selling Super Nintendo stuff again, so it wasn't until probably 2007, 2008, literally my last couple years of high school that I actually got my first one because I was a kid with no money and eBay didn't exist before that really. So Super Nintendo collecting is a bit more recent for me, but I've got a ton of history because I just played a metric crap ton of it. And again, I'm still not happy with that shadow. Is that better? Little bit. Uh, anyway, we're gonna get started with this. Starting with the first game in my collection, we have a launch title, this is Actraiser. Uh, this is a game I got more recently. I got this, I probably would say, uh, 2013, 2014 for Christmas. This was after I started my channel and uh, really it was this channel that kind of showed my parents that getting me games was kind of okay because I was trying to make a career out of this. So they said, okay, fine, you could ask for games now. And I got this for Christmas one year. And uh, this game is great. Unfortunately, not a lot of people remember this game. This was a launch title for the SNES, and I mean, when you put this alongside Super Mario World, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle, but it's a shame because it's amazing, and there's nothing quite like Actraiser. I have got a full review of this and a full Let's Play plus gameplay footage, but what really makes this game interesting is it is two games in one. You have this sort of clumsy, chunky, awkward platforming segment, which really isn't all that good. But then once you clear a level, it turns into this top-down god mode game where you have to rebuild the world you just saved. It's really, really a ton of fun. Unfortunately, this game doesn't really have a sequel. I mean, it does, but the sequel axes half the gameplay. And spoilers, it's not the choppy, awkward platforming. It's the fun god gaming bits that really gave this game its unique personality, which is a damn shame because that was the best bits. But uh, this is a great game, tons of really interesting deep stuff, a lot of stuff that got censored of course because you were God fighting Satan, now you're the master fighting some guy named Tanzra for reasons. Um, but there's a lot of really deep concepts in here including like heresy and sacrifice and all sorts of weird religious concepts and cults and stuff. Really interesting fascinating game and it's a Enix game I believe by Quintet and it actually utilizes that famous starry sky background they loved so much. In fact, they reused a lot of assets in this in their next game, which was uh, Soul Blazer. Um, and for those of you with a sharp eye watching in the future, I'm actually going to use that background for something in the channel. And for those of you who uh, want to see that happen sooner, anyone with online digital art, uh, art skills that don't expect to be paid, you know, hook me up. I'm, I'm working on channel art. I've been doing that for a year and a half and it's going really, really slow. Um, 
But if you want to help support the channel by building some channel art, or at least help with what I've got, that would be great. Uh, enough of the plugs, though. Uh, next we have Arrow the Acrobat. This is Sunsoft on the Super Nintendo, and that's when they stopped being good. They had, like, three different mascot characters, all trying to be like Sonic the Hedgehog, all trying to be edgy and cool. There was Arrow, there was, uh, he had his own nemesis enemy character called Zero the Kamikaze Squirrel, who had a Japanese headband, which, kind of racist, maybe? I, I always thought that was just kind of weird and sort of racist. Um, none of them were really all that well developed. It's, it's an awkward platformer, it's very difficult. Uh, not that great. I got this in a bundle with a bunch of other games, though, and uh, this this is not the high point of that collection. But uh, Arrow the Acrobat, it got a sequel, it got a spin-off. Uh, Sunsoft went on to develop multiple new mascots for themselves, and they never focused on the ones they had from, like, Euphoria, which were actually good. And instead, they just focused on new stuff that didn't really ever pan out, and that's why they're not around anymore. Okay, next we have our first import. We have Alkahest. I showed this off on my collection videos last year. Uh, this was a RPG. Now, I'm a big fan of RPGs. It was the Super Nintendo that got me really into RPGs, and I'd like to own every Super Nintendo and Super Famicom RPG I can. Uh, this one was by HAL Laboratory, and it's a top-down sort of arcadey experience. It's a little awkward, and it's not great, but there is a translation for it, and it's still an interesting experience. Uh, running around trying to like access new areas jumping around trying to figure out what it's worth I haven't played a ton of this pretty much all the footage you've seen is my entire experience with this You know until I have to report more for this giving myself infinitely more work to do, but I like Alkahest It was okay. It was a game. I got for a dollar um, And for that it was a decent enough price I suppose Okay, next we have a shmup uh, Someone told me a lot about this is the Japanese version we have Area 88, based on an anime and manga. Uh, we got this in North America as UN Squadron, but this game was infinitely cheaper if I bought it from Japan. So I did. Um, it's it's a um, horizontally scrolling shooter with really big, chunky sprites. I love that. There's tons of upgrades, uh, different planes and stuff. I like it, but I haven't sunk a ton of time into this. It's I, I prefer vertical scrolling shmups to horizontal ones, honestly. But uh, Area 88, a lot of people recommended this one to me a long time ago, so I gave it a shot, and it's uh, it's pretty fun, but it's also very difficult from what I remember, although it has been quite a while. Okay, next we have one of the big imports. Uh, like, I like to say there's like five really important import RPGs. If you're importing for this, this is one of them. We have Bahamut Lagoon. This is a sort of um, uh, RPG strategy game of sorts. Uh, you play as a dragon tamer, and you have to build up a party, and every character gets like their own dragon, but the dragons play entirely autonomous to you, if I recall. It's a very difficult game from what I remember, but it has some of the most beautiful sprite work I've ever seen on this thing. Like, seriously, the sprite work looks like it's 2D stuff from like the PS1 or the Saturn. It is just some of the beaut most beautiful sprite work I've ever seen. I'm not the biggest strategy RPG kind of guy, but this was a really important pickup for me. And I really like Bahamut Lagoon, even though I've gotten not very far into it. Um, there, are, I've, I've been playing a lot of the other big five. I have all five of them, but uh, that's, that's the first one worth noting. Okay, next we have ourselves. Ooh, the first one in this series. We have Battle Dodgeball. Now, Battle Dodgeball is one of the great battle games. It happens to feature the Gundam Alex, uh, one of the Mazingers, uh, what appears to be a Jim Cannon, uh, the F-91, the Zeta, a whole bunch of characters. Uh, now, I've talked at length about the great battle games. They were interesting sort of budget releases that Ben Presto over here released. And every year they release a new one. There were six numbered ones, five of which are on the Super Nintendo. There's like 30 some odd ones in the total series. And for the most part, a lot of them were really, really cheap and easy to find, with the exceptions of uh, the pinball game, number five, and there's one for the PSP that was only available as a pre-order bonus. I'm never going to get that one, but I want to collect all these. But this is a dodgeball game, kind of sort of in the vein of the Kunio Kun uh, Niket's dodgeball games, except you get to play as Gundam. <laughs> 
And I mean, that's pretty awesome right there. Uh, the Dodgeball series actually happened to do really, really well for this series, so they actually made three of them. One of them was said uh, pre-order thing for the PSP that's really, really hard to get, but I gotta admit, I quite like Battle Dodgeball. And it was one of many games that made me really want to collect the Great Battle series. Okay, our next title is, and this will shock you, but Battle Pinball. Yeah. Featuring Kamen Rider, uh, Ultraman, some other guys, the original RX-782 Gundam. As I try and focus slightly better, there we go. That's the focus we need. As well as their own original character, the Fighter Roar, which was not introduced until the second game in the series. This is the pinball game. It's really, really hard to find. It is one of the more awkward and difficult ones to find, and it's one of two that I've only ever seen one copy of ever. Um, the easy way to explain this game is it's sort of like Super Robot Pinball on the Super Nintendo, or uh, on the Game Boy Color, but for the Super Nintendo, except it's nowhere near as good. This thing has significantly more powerful hardware, but it's just not half as good, I don't think. Um, the tables themselves are not particularly all that well done, the overall physics are a little bit janky, and honestly, I do not care much for this game, as much as I do love Super Robot Pinball. This thing has a lot more tables, as opposed to Super Robot Pinball's one table, but other than the, just the sheer number of tables, everything to this game is inferior to the handheld counterpart. But damn if it's not another great battle game, and I want to own them all. And uh, I'm really proud I happen to have a copy of this. Um, fun game, interesting concept but it could be significantly better done. Alright, next we have, and this will shock you, but it's another one in the series, we have uh, Battle Racer. Uh, this is basically the Great Battles equivalent of Mario Kart, kind of. You can play as the Victory 2 Gundam, uh, one of the Kamen Riders, Ultraman, and again Roar, plus a bunch of other characters. I've got a gameplay footage thing of this. It's um, it's pretty good for what feels kind of like a knockoff. I don't want to say clone, I hate using the term clone to describe things, but it's a very, very Mode 7 heavy racing game, and, you know, I like it a lot. It's, uh, it's a ton of fun, and it's another great battle game. And it's one of the harder ones to find, I think. Not super hard, mind you, but it's, it's up there. Alright, next we have one of my games of the year last year, two years ago, rather. We have Battle Tycoon Flash Hiders SFX. Now, that name makes me think that it's an, a game that utilizes the FX chip to create 3D environments. That's why I bought it. Uh, I was looking for a 2D fighter that had a, like a 3D environment where if you hit your opponent hard enough, like the entire screen would sort of rotate around it. Uh, that was not this game. But what I got was a cross between a management sim, a fighting game, and an RPG. And it is one of the coolest fighting games I think I've ever played. I have a full review of this. It was on my game of the year list. I think I've got a gameplay video of this. I know my buddy Caleb and I did a video on this back in the day with the Ranma 1 half games. Go take a look at that video, that was fun. But this is one of the coolest fighting games I think you can import. Like, bar none, but especially for the Super Famicom. Certainly a very interesting title, really ambitious, and I think it pulls it off pretty damn well. Alright, next we have... Battle Soccer. For when you want to play soccer with the great battle guys and fight baby Godzilla sometimes, I guess. Um, I'm not the biggest football fan. I played soccer for a good many years when I was a kid and I hated every moment of it. Um, so I'm not really thrilled to own this, but I want to collect all the great battle games, so I have this. Um, and, and that's really all I have to say about it. Don't have a lot to say because I'm honestly giving it a shot yet, but uh, yeah. Alright, next we have a game I also played with my buddy Caleb. This is by Cobra Team. It is Bastard, which... Again, looks like a sort of 3D fighting game, sort of, but it's more like a third-person shooter. It's a weird, weird game. It's really hard to hit your opponents in this game. It feels like your enemies sort of like magnetically repel shots. Like, even if a shot is going straight at them, it feels like they just curve at the last minute to miss everything entirely. Um, I don't like this game particularly. I actually have the DVD set of the anime, and I've never watched it just because I hate this game so much. But it looks, at least fairly interesting, but it's one of the most non-consequential games I think I've ever played for the Super Nintendo. 
Speaking of games that were on my poop list, uh, we have Big Sky Trooper by JVC and I believe LucasArts. Uh, this is a top-down sort of RPG adventure game mixed with asteroids at some point. Uh, I liken this to basically being the Super Nintendo's attempt at, um, uh, what is it, uh, No Man's Sky, because it's basically that. You're running around on an empty planet, shooting things sometimes, and then moving on really, really fast with very little consequence. I don't know if I just haven't gotten further enough into the game to really run into moments that really matter, but this game really, really sucked. <laughs> I, this is not my game, unfortunately. Okay, next we have a game I've reviewed and another Christmas gift. I believe this was given to me during my second tour of college back in 2013, right about when I made this channel. Uh, we have Brain Lord. This is the sequel to the Seventh Saga, an, a game I do not have yet. Uh, it is also the prequel to... Uh, what is it? There, there was one more. When I find it, I'll let you know. It's, it's in my collection, but this one is different because the others were all top-down or, or the others were all turn-based RPGs. This one is a top-down action RPG adventure game. It is a dungeon crawler that only features four or five dungeons, which sucks, but those dungeons are ridiculously big. This game is a massive amount of fun, and what's interesting is you play a character that happens to be a summoner. Like, you get these little crystals that have fairies in them, you free the fairies from the crystals, they gather experience, they get better. Uh, there's a way to break this game really easy if you're willing to grind early on because you can buy a crystal that has a fairy that it will attack for you. Just get two of those and you don't ever have to fight anything in the game except for bosses because they don't work on them. But other than that, it kind of breaks the game wide open. I wish this game was a lot longer. I wish it got a sequel that played like this. But if you're looking for RPGs on the Super Nintendo, Brain Lord is one of the coolest. Unfortunately, this game gets pretty expensive nowadays. I think I got it sort of just on the cusp of it starting to get a lot of attention. Alright, next we have a game that was traded to me by my girlfriend. We have Congo's Caper, also known as Joe and Mac 2, uh, minus the Joe and the Mac, which is why the next game was actually called Joe and Mac 2, but it was actually 3 in Japan. It, it's confusing. It's an interesting game, but it's really awkwardly balanced. Uh, the first few areas of the game are really cool because it's like exactly one for one retreading the original Joe and Mac, but with anime monkey characters. It, it's really cool looking. But then after that, it turns into like this completely really ridiculously hard platformer. I gotta review this up. I like this game, but it's uh, it's got issues to say the least. Also, I'm really worried about getting this done before my battery crashes because it's about to. Um, so we might have to chip this off and uh, clip it real soon, but uh, let's see if we can get one more out of this. We have Cybernator. Um, this is another instance of me being a dumbass and getting a game that is not the one I thought I was getting. I, when I got this, I was thinking I was getting Metal Warriors, which was by LucasArts, and that game is ridiculously rare and expensive, which is why I don't have a copy. This is actually Assault Suit Lanos 2, I believe. Uh, it's a side-scrolling shooter with mechs. It is really difficult, but it's a lot of fun. Um, like I said, it's not exactly the game I thought I was getting when I purchased it, but I'm still glad I got it. I got it in a bundle with Arrow the Acrobats and a few other games, and, uh, you know, Cybernator, not the game I thought I was getting, but it's still a ton of fun, and if you're into the Assault Suit games, if you're into side-scrolling shooters, this one's kind of a mix of scrolling shooter platformer mech combat. Really, really fun. Alright, next we have another game that my girlfriend got for me. Uh, Demon's Crest. This is the only game in the Red Aramur series I have, but this is basically a spin-off of Ghouls and Ghosts, except you play as the villain Firebrand, the uh, Red Aramur himself. And it's sort of a side-scrolling, jumpy platformer mixed with an RPG a little bit. You have to, like, gather items and build your stats to get better. You have to collect all the different crests to turn to different modes. It's a very, very interesting series. I love the Red Aramur series, but they're really hard to find, and this one is no exception. I quite like Demon's Crest, and what's interesting is I actually got this game for free. Um, when I was ordering, uh, when my girlfriend and I were getting this game, we ordered two from this one guy, and uh, he told us, well, Demon's Crest, uh, we want a little bit more, and someone else bought it. So, sorry, and uh, then I guess the person who bought it didn't actually pay for it, so he just threw it in for free. Um, really great game, really excited that I have it. Played it for a bit. I like it a lot more than Ghouls and Ghosts, which is good. 
and we might uh, get cut off real quick because we're running out of time. But we have Dragon Quest 1 and 2. I've never played the second one, played the shit out of the first one the moment I picked it up and instantly became a fan of Dragon Quest and started collecting the rest on the Super Nintendo because everyone up to that point was remade for it except number 4, which I do not have. Um, it's a very, very original RPG, but I can see why this is kind of one of the definitive ones. It feels very old and it's a little bit finicky with its inventory management, but I absolutely love this game and uh, someday I'm going to play the second one. But I love Dragon Quest 1. I, I would like to collect all of them. I know the 8th one on the PS2 is really famous, I'd like to get that. And uh, before we cut out, boom, Dragon Quest 3. Um, again, I got all the ones on the Super Nintendo, so we're going to continue with that moving forward. But uh, this is a very historically important one because the first two sort of told the story of a hero, like his descendant. This one's about the actual hero himself and what he does. And uh, that's really cool because he gets to sort of live out the legend himself. Whereas the original, you were just kind of some guy who was sort of related to someone else. Now you actually get to really realize the legend itself. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, I love the Dragon Quest games, and this one's pretty great. Anyway, I am running out of camera space and battery, so that'll be it for now, but we're going to make a quick clip, and we'll be back in just a sec. And we're going to continue this with Dragon Quest V. This is my favorite of all the Dragon Quest games I have played. Uh, this is a really cool game. First of all, it's another Dragon Quest, and it's been fan-translated, so I can actually play it. And uh, what's really cool about this is it's a generational type of game. Like, you start off playing as like a little kid following your dad around, not really able to even fight for yourself, he has to fight for you. And uh, then you kind of slowly grow up and you kind of find your own fighting style, which kind of is like that of a uh, monster tamer and a summoner, which is really cool. Uh, and then you kind of like slowly live your life, develop a family. It's a really, really deep, interesting game. I think that uh, Dragon Quest V is the best Dragon Quest game that I've ever played, certainly. It has um, a pretty deep and interesting story. It's got some interesting plot twists. I quite like this game. If you like any of the Dragon Quest games, I think you got to play this one because I've, out of all the Dragon Quest games I've played, Dragon Quest V is really my favorite one of the lot. It plays like all the others, but it adds like the monster catching mechanics. It adds like a, a really fun story and it just, it, it takes what Dragon Quest made, what made Dragon Quest great rather, and it ultimately added its own unique flair and made it even better. And that's, that's pretty cool to me. Okay, next we have, and this is gonna shock you, but Dragon Quest VI. Uh, this one I actually have not spent any time with. Uh, every time I play Dragon Quest, I just go back to five, honestly. Um, but I wanted to get the full uh, Super Famicom Dragon Quest collection. So here we are with six. I'm gonna play with the lighting a little bit. I apologize. I, I've been trying to figure out lighting in between while I charge my battery. Uh, that's a little bit better. Anyway, Dragon Quest six. It is more Dragon Quest as far as I know. Uh, I don't really know too much more other than that because I haven't had a chance to play it yet. But uh, for this, I will have to record at least a little bit. I'm betting it's going to be turn-based. I'm betting that combat will be in first person. And I'm betting it's going to be Akira Toriyama-tastic, as indicated by all the characters looking very, very Dragon Ball. And that's a lot of fun, too. Alright, next we have a game sent to the show by my lovely, lovely girlfriend. We have Draken. Um, this is a weird RPG type thing. It's got like this nice, huge, polygonal open world you can go explore, but it's really confusing and awkward to get around. I had a lot of issues with this game. I played, I, I reviewed it, and uh, it's confusing and a little tricky to understand, and it's really, really, really exceptionally easy to die in this game. Uh, if you ever run into a, uh, a um, gravestone, a giant dog shows up and murders you horribly. Uh, this is the game where stars out of the sky turn to monsters and just fall and completely decimate you. There's, It's really easy to run to monsters that just completely outpace you very, very early on. But it is a very technically impressive game for what it's worth. That said, it also had a sequel that got rid of most of the sort of obtuse RPGness for some more fun, like, real-time hacky slashiness. 
and it did everything better in this game. I reviewed that game too, and I think I ended up saying like the worst thing about that game was when it tried to be this game. And that's just a testament to, first of all, how good that game is, but also the things that Draken did wrong. But that said, it's still a very technically impressive game, and I think it's a very important game, even though it might not be necessarily the most fun. I think it's a very important game all the same. Alright, next we have a game I actually have not played. I got this one recently in a bundle. We have Earthlight. Um, as far as I'm aware, this is a strategy game. As noted by the fact it says Anime Tick Space War Game. It's by Hudson. And that's really all I know about it, but apparently it costs someone a little less than $3, as indicated by the 280 yen sticker. And I guess I'm going to have to play this to figure out what exactly it is. But that said, I got this in a bundle with Alkahest, and I bought it basically just for Alkahest, to be honest. Um, but this was a fun little extra bonus thing, so that's, that's good. But it's not something I went out of my way to try and get, because I'm not the biggest strategy guy, and strategy games in a different language just seem like a giant minefield I don't really want to try and get into, because it seems like a good way to spend a lot of money and not get very, where, very far in any real game in particular. But we'll give this one a shot. Alright, next we have... This came in the box with Final Fantasy. This is extra innings, and I have really got to actually clean this thing out. Uh, in case you can't tell, I haven't actually played this. This is a baseball game. I don't play baseball all that much. Uh, the only baseball game I've really played was the one that I did to make the review last year dedicated to my late grandfather. That said, it's by Sony ImageSoft, which makes one of three Super Nintendo games I know that have their logo, this Skyblazer and Mickey Mania. Um, I have seen a few screenshots of this. It actually looks like a lot of fun. It, it at least looks like a very good game. So we're going to have to give this one a shot, but I'm expecting baseball out of this baseball game. I might be crazy to do so, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that the baseball game will probably at least contain hints and or traces of indeed baseball. Alright, next we have, oh this is a big name, and it was a very early RPG for the N64, the N64. yes, it was an early game for the, N the Super Nintendo. Uh, we have Final Fantasy IV. Now this is the Japanese version, and that actually makes a huge, huge difference because the Japanese version, as compared to the English version, was significantly harder. In fact, I remember this one fight, uh, it's the fight where you get Kane, in fact. That fight was like just stupid hard, and that's a tutorial fight. Uh, I, I lost that fight so many times. But uh, they later released the English version in Japan, with a translation obviously, and that was known as Final Fantasy IV Easy Type, because they just made it so much easier than the Japanese version. Uh, I have the Japanese version just because it was cheaper and I can apply a translation to it, so that's fun. And there's fan translations as well, although it's, the one I found was kind of hit or miss. But uh, that said, it's Final Fantasy IV, I think it's one of the best Final Fantasies out there. Uh, you've got Cecil Harvey, you've got uh, Kane Highwind, you've got other characters, uh, Rosa. Uh, I, I think Final Fantasy IV has a lot of plot issues. I think every character that gets introduced, spoilers, dies within about five minutes of them getting introduced. Some of them for no reason, like uh, Pollum and Porum. But there are some really cool moments, like how uh, Cecil has to overcome himself to become a paladin as opposed to a dark knight. That was really cool. There's, there's some really cool moments in this game. I just think they could have gone a little bit deeper with developments of the story and the character building, but there's definitely a lot of hints of something really great here, and we would see that greatness, I think, emerge in Final Fantasy VI. But uh, yeah, Final Fantasy IV. I also have the Game Boy Advance version. Alright, next we have another Final Fantasy game, a little bit less well received. We have Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, also known as Final Fantasy USA, the Mystic Quest. Uh, this is baby's first RPG, and it's kind of insultingly easy in all regards. Uh, if you lose a fight, you can redo it at any point. Uh, all your health is measured with graphics as opposed to numbers for some reason. There's a lot to hate about this game, and I totally get that, especially considering we got this as opposed to Final Fantasy V, which was an actual great game and one of the best in the series. A little bitter about that, but uh, Mystic Quest... 
I don't think it deserves as much hate as it gets, but I think it's definitely deserved how much hate this does get. Uh, it's, it's insultingly easy, and it really does feel like it treats you like an absolute baby. Uh, you're thrown into multiple parties, all of which have someone who is significantly better than you. You are never the strongest member of the party. You are always the one holding them back from being the hero, despite the fact you're allegedly the hero. Your character's, like, ultimate signature is a sarcastic shrug for some reason. The story is just convoluted and goofy. Uh, there's, there's some things about this to like. The, the tone is just sort of silly, but it's not a very good game. I played this a few times. Uh, the soundtrack is tremendous and the visual design is great. Enemies take damage and visible damage and their sprites change as you hurt them, which is great. And the soundtrack, amazing. Otherwise, you could probably skip this one. But that said, if you want to play all the Final Fantasies, you gotta play Mystic Quest. But seriously, at the very least, just play the soundtrack. Alright, next we have... Front Mission, Gun Hazard. This is one of two Front Mission games I own. Well, I own three now, but it's one of two that I was really familiar with. And uh, unlike the other Front Mission games, except for the other one I have, this one is not like those. Front Mission is typically a turn-based strategy game featuring mechs and stuff. Front Mission Gun Hazard is basically a salt suit by the guys who made Final Fantasy. To be fair, my other Front Mission game was Front Mission Evolved, and that was just a pile of garbage. But this game is a ton of fun, it's been translated by fans, and if you like running around shooting things like in uh, Cybernator, like I showed earlier, uh, this is definitely one to look out for. It's not super expensive either, because it's an import only. But uh, Front Mission Gun Hazard is not your typical Front Mission game, but it's definitely a fun game in its own right, and I think it deserves a lot of respect for how good it is, because it is kind of like a... Uh, assault suit mix sort of with an RPG sort of system from what I remember. It was a really fun game. Alright, next we have uh, Ganbare Goman 2. This is a must-have import for anyone. It's uh, the second Mystical Ninja game for the Super Nintendo, except we never got it, which is unfortunate. And I just learned this finally got a translation. Uh, not that it really needed it. This, this game is entirely playable without a translation, which is great, but the fact that it did is kind of amazing to me. Because I followed the translation scene for this game for a very long time, and this game was known to be cursed. Everyone who took on a translation job for this kind of ended up quitting translation in general, or like their life fell apart, which is really sad, but uh, we got a translation for this, which is great. It's a 2D platformer featuring our boy Gomon, Ibisumaru, and Sasuke, everyone's favorite disco ninja super robot, fighting this guy, leader of the bunny invading people from America, General McGinnis. Um, it's, it's just a great little platformer. It's one of the best platformers on the Super Nintendo, honestly. And if you like Mystical Ninja, this one is a no-brainer. This is easily one of the best games in the series. And, you know, even if you don't want a translation or you can't have a translation for your game, this is a must-have because it's pretty much entirely playable without one. Uh, I love this platformer, and if you like platformers, you owe it to yourself to give this one a shot. And it's more Gomon. You can't go wrong with more Gomon. Okay, next we have Ganbare Goman 3, the third one. This actually also got a translation like right around the same time, which is pretty cool. This one is more of a top-down sort of Zelda-style adventure game, but it does have like 2D platforming stages. It's really, really interesting. You got the team all together, all four of them, Goman, Ibisumaru, Sasuke, and Ye, and uh, you got to go into the future to rescue the wise man who has been kidnapped by Ibisumaru's uh, great-great-grand son, I want to say, or daughter, I don't know. It, it is a weird character, but uh, basically, it's Mystical Ninja in time. You go to the future, I've reviewed this game, go check out that review, but uh, uh, it's, it's definitely a hard game to play without translation because it's more of an adventure game than a platformer. You kind of have to talk to a lot of people to know where to go, and it's a little bit tough. It's doable, but it's certainly a lot harder than the previous entry. That said, now that it does have a translation, even just one that's sort of a partial translation would have made this game infinitely easier. So I'm going to have to go back and play this one through, I think. But uh, Mystical Ninja 3, not quite as recommended as 2, but it's a great game, and the Gomon games are all incredibly excellent experiences. Alright, next we have, and this will shock you, but uh, Gamari Gomon 4, Mystical Ninja in Space. 
yeah. This actually goes back more to the roots of Mystical Ninja 2, although there's a lot more puzzle elements. Like, every time you go to a town, you have to solve some sort of puzzle, which requires a lot of reading. Unfortunately, as far as I know, this one hasn't gotten a translation yet, so... Um, you still need a guide to go through those puzzle bits, but the platforming bits are simple enough. Um, really, I would say this one kind of goes in between 2 and 3 for how desirable it would be as a translation or an untranslated import, but that said, it's still a ton of fun, and it's a beautiful, beautiful game. That said, I found the platforming in this one to be a little bit wonkier, and you can see that in my review, and one of the biggest things I dislike about this game is how it handles your giant robot impact and minigames, two things that are in pretty much every Gomon game. Because unlike having a bunch of minigames and having giant mech battles, this one combines the two and takes your mech into minigames, and you have to beat them to continue, they're not optional, which kind of sucks, but still, I think this game is a ton of fun, and again, you gotta collect all the Gomon games, they're just, they're must-haves. Unfortunately, I still don't have the original Legend of Mystical Ninja, and I don't have the weird Ibisumaru puzzle thing, but otherwise I've got the full set on the Super Famicom. Alright, next we have another Konami import. We have Gokujo Parodius. Uh, it's Parodius. It's like Gradius, except goofier. You play as Twin B or a, like, penguin or an octopus or uh, the thing from um, Gradius. Or you can play as Gomon. I think you can play as uh, Dracula as well from Castlevania in here, although he's uh, Dracula-kun from... Uh, um, well, uh, Dracula couldn't really, but, but still, it's basically Gradius, but with a goofy paint job applied to it, and it's pretty awesome. There's a bunch of different uh, Parodius games. Some of them actually came out in, I, I think this one did actually, in Europe, in English, which is pretty cool. Uh, but I've got this Japanese copy, and I've been told, at least out of the Super Nintendo ones, Gokujo Parodius is the one you want. It's, it's like the best of the best, so to speak. And it's a tremendously fun and strange shooter, but it is also Gradius. It's very, very difficult. But uh, I, I think if you're into shooters, that's one to definitely keep an eye out for. All right, next we have a game I've reviewed. This is The Great Battle, SD The Great Battle. Uh, like I said about the other Great Battle games, this is part of the main series, whereas those were like sports and goofy odd spin-offs. But the Great Battle series was sort of like budget titles that they got released every single year. They they knocked them out back to back to back. But what was interesting is every single game in the main series were completely different. This was a top-down shooter platformer of sorts. Where you play as Gundam, Ultraman, and the Masked Rider, defeating all the various Xeon suits and Masked Rider enemies and whoever Ultraman fought. Uh, it's it's a goofy good time. It's it's not the most great or well-made game as you could say with pretty much all the great battle games But it's a ton of fun and if you're looking for an import that's easy to play without a translation. I think that uh, The great battle games are absolute must-haves. You got to invest in them because they're just a fantastic import experience All right next we have and this will shock you, but this is the great battle 2 also known as uh, uh, the Last Fighter, I believe. Last Fighter Twin, something like that. Uh, this one features Gundam F91, Ultraman, and one of the Kamen Riders. I know nothing about Kamen Rider. As well as Ben Presto introducing their own insert character, the Fighter Roar. This was his debut. And uh, this is one of the few great battle games out there that I would say is bad. Uh, I put this on my poop list when I got it, and it deserves to be there. It is a sort of SD final fight beat em up type of thing, but the thing is your character's head is so much bigger than his body and their arms and legs are so small that it's really hard to hit anything. You have to like stand in your opponent to actually hit them. And that makes, you know, hitting them kind of a tricky proposition in that it's something that doesn't really happen all that well, or at least comfortably. You know, I like to say that, you know, the great battle games maybe aren't the most well-made games ever, but they're at least fun. This is one of the few exceptions, I think. But that said, like most of the great battle games, it's not super expensive, so you can get it pretty cheap. Next we have Shocker, but Great Battle 3. Uh, this I've actually seen for sale in town in um, a place, but they were charging like 50 bucks for it. I bought this for $2 from Japan. Uh, this is a beat-em-up similar to the last one, except it's more trying to be 
like, um, what, what's it? It's Golden Axe. So all your characters, while they're still kind of super deformed, they all have weapons, which actually gives them reach. And this is an actual really, really fun, fun beat em up. And from what I recall, all these games actually did get a translation by Eon Genesis since I last talked about a great battle game. So I'm going to have to find those translations and apply them to the carts. But uh, basically, it's Golden Axe with Gundam and Kamen Rider and Ultraman and uh, Ben Presto's own character. It's, it's a killer combination. And this one is a ton of fun, whereas number two was not. All right, next we have my intro to this series. We have The Great Battle 4. And this is basically bringing Ultraman, Gundam, and Kamen Rider into the world of Mega Man X. I, uh, I reviewed this way back in the day, ton of fun. Uh, you take your characters, you platform around, you shoot a whole bunch. There are mech battles, which fight kind of like Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Those aren't the most well made, but it's an interesting concept. And this game was so good, it made me try and collect the entire series, which I've got maybe a third of at this point. Um, long way to go to get all the great battle games, but this one is a ton of fun. And if you're into side-scrolling shooters like Mega Man X, Mega Man, Contra, all that good stuff, the Great Battle 4 might not be the most fantastic game you could play, but I think it's a pretty good one. And I'm running out of time, so i got to hurry with these next two. Okay, we have The Great Battle 5. This is closer to a combination of Wild Guns and like a 2D platforming beat-em-up. Uh, the platforming bits are a little weird, but the Wild Guns third-person over-the-shoulder shooting is a ton of fun. Uh, the Great Battle 5 is one of the rarest games in the Great Battle series because it's just, uh, it's, it's hard to track down, but you get to play as Kamen Rider, uh, one of the Ultramen, and what appears to be the God Gundam, along with everyone's favorite, the Fighter Roar. And they all have different weapons, and they all play slightly differently, which is a ton of fun. Uh, I like this game a lot. This is, along with Battle Pinball, one of the rarest games ever. I've only seen it on eBay once or twice, and it's always over $100. I got this at an auction for about 30 but uh, if you're collecting all of them, this is one you got to watch out for because it will be expensive and it would be easy to break the bank with this one. And it's a great battle game, so it's not one of the most fantastic games ever made, so it's probably not worth that kind of money. And I've got one minute left on my camera, but we have a gift from my girlfriend, Hagane, a game you could only get from Blockbuster, which is why it's such a rare, expensive collector's item. But uh, she got me this, and it's a fun ninja platformer thing. I don't think it's really as good as some people make it out to be, but it is a fun game all the same. Running around, flipping around as a ninja robot, hacking and slashing people to bits. A uh, bit of an epilepsy warning with this one. You've got like a bomb attack that causes like really, really bad strobe effects. I'm not going to use it when I play the gameplay, but it's worth knowing if you're going to look out for this game. Uh, I, I played it and it, I don't have seizures or anything, but it gave me really tremendous headaches. So it's, it's really, really bad. But Hagane is a fun game. I don't think it's worth the insane price it normally commands, though. And I'm running out of camera space, so I will be back with my third row of Super Nintendo Super Famicom games in just a sec. All right, on to row three of my collection, starting with the incredibly kick-ass Holy Umbrella. I've got a couple of videos on this one. This is a really great game by uh, Nexatsoft. Uh, unfortunately, this game is really, really hard to find and expensive. Um, I first came into familiarity with this, I think either through a multi-cart or just playing on uh, my digital archive for the sake of just sort of exploring some imports I could look into in the future. And when I played this, I immediately knew I had to have a copy. Unfortunately, hard to find and expensive, but it is a really, really kick-in platformer. You play as this random kid who finds an umbrella on a rainy day, gets teleported to some sort of random, like, uh, next world he gets isekai basically and now he has to find a way back with the help of a bird and i guess this girl i i didn't get super far into this because every time i play it i end up like losing my save data and having to start over but uh this is a really fun game it is a 2d platformer where all the characters have different abilities and you get different power-ups to boost their abilities so that you can platform differently with each character and get through different puzzles and then combine that with like top-down RPG segments where you have to talk to people in towns to figure out where to go next. Uh, while this is in Japanese, it has been translated by the fantastic team Eon Genesis. And, uh, you know, they did what they do best, which is make a really good translation of a fairly awesome Japanese game. 
And honestly, I think we should have gotten this game in North America because it just really is that damn fantastic. That said, it is kind of an obscurity even in Japan, which is really kind of a shame because it is a really, really fun game. Like I said, I've got a review, I've got a gameplay footage thing. I don't have a review, I've got a um, uh, first impressions thing, plus a gameplay thing, and I'm gonna review this real soon, I think, because really, me not reviewing this game is a crying shame, because it is just that damn good. Holy Umbrella, I think, is a must-have for importers. Alright, uh, I don't know the full title of this game offhand, I apologize, but this is uh, Hano something something Dodge Danpe, which is anime dodgeball of flame featuring the Gravedigger from Ocarina of Time. That is only about 10% wrong as far as I'm aware. I got this in a bundle for about an extra two cents, and I actually have not had the time to play this one at all, but I guess I will for footage for this. Uh, anime dodgeball game, kind of like the Kunio Kun games, and um, you run around school talking to people to recruit them to your dodgeball team to then end up fighting other people, presumably. That's, that's kind of what I know based on um, what, what little I've looked into this game. Again, it was something I got in a bundle for very little. Uh, that said, this was also available on the Famicom Game Boy. I think there was also an N64 and PS1 release of this, or at least something with a similar name in the same series, so I think this might actually be like connected to an anime or a manga, although, again, I'm not 100% on that, because I don't know all that much, but it is Sunsoft, and uh, it was... SNES or, or Super Famicom Sunsoft, so I'm a little bit hesitant, but uh, we'll give it a go. Alright, next we have a game I definitely did review, as much as I wish I probably hadn't. We have Jim Power in Lost Dimensions in 3D. Woo, 3D. Yeah. Uh, this is a platforming run and gun game that is designed by people who hate you, basically. Uh, you play as Dolph Lundgren running around shooting things that pop out pretty much right on top of him and kill him instantly because he has no health. Uh, the weapons are kind of interesting. I will point out that the screen scrolls way too fast and in the opposite direction that it should. Uh, this game is largely nauseating and just disorienting to play and it will kill you a whole bunch. However, it has an amazing soundtrack by Chris Hulsbeck, which is... Uh, really why you want to play this game. It's got a tremendous soundtrack. Everything else about this game is kind of garbage, but uh, it's it's got a great soundtrack. That's the problem though. This game could almost maybe be good. Almost. If they just made everything a little bit slower because you run too fast, the screen scrolls far too much to the right. Like you, you don't actually start scrolling the screen until you get super far to the right. Enemies spawn right on top of you and my cat's about to jump up the wall so there's gonna be a whole lot of sound. I apologize for that. I really want to make sure he did that before I recorded this, but he's a cat. He, he makes some rules. Ain't he a treasure? Uh, anyway, this is uh, Jim Power. It's part of a series, and this is apparently available on Steam too, and it looks just as bloody disorienting then as it does now. And the sad thing is, if they just made everything a little bit slower, this would actually be a pretty damn fun game. But as it stands, it is just running way too fast and just really uncomfortable. And I have no idea how people allowed that to get released in the state it did. All right, next we have Kirby Bowl, also known as Kirby's Dream Course. I actually have this on the SNES Classic, but uh, this is the Japanese copy I got before I got that. Uh, basically, it's golf crossed with bowling with Kirby as the ball for some reason, because Kirby just cannot catch a break and just be a proper Nintendo mascot. He has to be like the experimental guinea pig. I've said this so many times and I feel bad for poor Kirby, because he just seems like the most abused Nintendo mascot of all. Like, of, of the main ones, he's definitely kind of the abused one. Anyway, Kirby tricks the form of a ball and you have to hit him into enemies to destroy them, and once you destroy all but one, the final enemy turns into a hole that you have to sink him in to finish the level and you only have so many shots to do it, because if you don't, he dies. And if you fall off a cliff, he dies. Uh, this, this game is not an easy game. It's an interesting game. I wouldn't say it's necessarily the best one. I do have a review of this game, but um, not the best game, but it's interesting. What's really cool about this game, and it's, it's such a dumb, small thing, but I love it, is when you start, you get to like design your own name tag with like a pixel editor, which I think is really cool. 
Uh, so you could write your name or you could like draw a little doodle or something. They even give you Kirby stamps, which I think is really cool. I Honestly, I feel like there's more game potential in that than the actual game they created, but they came up with a pretty interesting idea all the same. And if you like golf or bowling or Kirby, I guess, despite the fact they really do treat him like garbage, that's it's one worth looking at for. Alright, next we have, I'm pretty sure the only proper Koei game I have, which I'm sad about because Koei had some great games back in the day, it's also a game I've reviewed. We have the legendary Inindo, Way of the Ninja. I think I said this in my review, this is basically the reverse Nobunaga's Ambition. Because Nobunaga's Ambition was a strategy game where you played as Oda Nobunaga, trying to reunite all of Japan to become like a unified Japan. Uh, whereas in this one, you play a ninja whose village was raised by Nobunaga, and you are trying to basically behind the scenes uh, strengthen yourself in an awesome RPG, along with allying yourself with all the other warlords that Nobunaga is currently fighting, to ultimately claim enough territory to get close to him to murder him. It's uh, it's it's weird because it starts out as like a very basic RPG, and then it kind of turns into a convoluted like strategy game, but this game is amazingly fun. If you like SNES RPGs or strategy games, you have to get it. Also, it is a Koei game by Koshi Musawa back in the day, so you know it's going to have probably a very simple presentation, but ridiculously deep mechanics, and it does. Uh, you can talk to people when you go to inns and like challenge them to fights and try and recruit them. You can just get randomly jumped outside. Like If you don't sleep at an inn, you can actually get tired, fall asleep, and get jumped by enemies and get murdered instantly. This game is ridiculously deep. It is very, very mean to you at times if you're not uh, not too careful, but uh, In Indo Way of the Ninja is a legendarily fun RPG, and I wish I had more Koei games on the Super Nintendo. I know they made the really cool Uncharted Water games, which I'd like to play more of because I played a little bit of them through the Virtual Console. Fun games. Uh, but that's the thing about these old Koei games, as awesome as they are, they also usually came with a um, manual about the size of a phone book because they're just so overly complex. But I think Nintendo is one of the more easy to get into ones. And uh, you know, those old Koei games, they weren't Dynasty Warriors 2 over and over and over, which I think is a big plus in their defense. All right, next we have, and I mentioned this at the start, like I didn't have a Super Nintendo, I inherited mine from a family friend and I didn't get my first game until I was high, in high school. Uh, here it is, Illusion of Gaia. Um, I played this game once. I had a specialty game rental store I got to go to like twice a year. It's now a paint shop and I'm sad about that, but um, I rented this once when I was a kid and I remembered everything about it. Like I remember reading the manual back to front over and over again. I remember Will, I remember his his alter ego, uh, Frieden, who has like the greatest sprite on all of the Super Nintendo, I will stand by that. Uh, Shadow, I remember all these great things about this game. I could not remember the name of this to save my life, and I spent years upon years upon years searching the entire SNES catalog to finally understand what this game was. And uh, this was the first SNES game I ever bought. And, um, you know, the moment I heard it, I hopped onto eBay, which was like still in its infancy, and I saw this on there for like, I think, 30 cents or something. It was basically worth nothing. Can we go back to that time where SNES games were worth nothing on eBay? Seriously, I remember seeing like Super Metroid being given away for a penny, and had I had money at the time, I would have bought it. Uh, Kirby Superstar being given away for free, because people just didn't want Super Nintendo games. I want all the Super Nintendo games! If you have Super Nintendo games you don't want, send them to me. <laughs> they will be well loved. Um, but uh, Illusion of Gaia is a great game. I know a lot of people like to dump on my review because it's mostly negative, but... You know, all that negativity also stems from the fact that every other word out of my mouth is this is one of my favorite games on the system, and it absolutely is. Uh, it's a top-down RPG, uh, action RPG, where he plays all the different characters, uh, sort of diving into all these really deep and interesting caves and stuff. And what's interesting is a lot of it has to do with both biblical and, like, real-life Earth history. So you're kind of exploring, like, the pyramids of Giza, the Nazca Lines, the, uh, the, uh, you know, Angkor Wat, uh, Great Wall of China, all that sort of stuff to try and ultimately climb the Tower of Babel to figure out what happened to your father. All while exploring like these like deep religious overtones that mostly got scrubbed out of this. But it's also a Quintet Enix game, which means it has that awesome star background that I love so much. Uh, it also uses a lot of sound effects from ActRaiser. Not as many as uh, the predecessor to this game, but it does use quite a few. Uh, basically, Illusion of Guy is amazing. I love this game quite a lot. Despite the fact it does have a few issues, I 
think this is still one of the best SNES RPGs out there, especially if you like action RPGs. Alright, next we have the Lagoon Award winning game for terrible game I couldn't stop winning, or couldn't stop playing, Lagoon, the titular Lagoon. Uh, this game is in top-down action RPG where you fight with a butter knife. <laughs> it is the smallest weapon of all time. Uh, your character is incredibly weak. It feels a little bit like Ease where you don't really attack so much. You just sort of mash your face against the enemy until you kind of hope to win. But at least you have a weapon swing animation even though you have to stand in your opponent to use it. Um, Lagoon is not an easy game to get into. I think a lot of people would say this is a terrible, terrible, terrible game. And I kind of can understand that, but at the same time, I, I think I once used the term compellingly terrible. Like, it is not necessarily the most fun game to play, but you can't stop playing it because it's still just really, really engrossing and fun. Uh, for example, uh, for how bad this game is, the first dungeon in this game is an escort quest. You have to escort this kid at the end of the dungeon all the way to the front. And he will follow you in real time, and you have to stay within like five steps of him, and he moves about a third your speed. What's better, you need to heal his broken ankle before you start with a healing potion. And the thing is, the only healing potion that you have is in the dungeon with him. So either you didn't find it or you used it, then you gotta leave the dungeon, go to town, go to the weapon shop, which is apparently a mistranslated item shop for some reason, whereas the weapon shop's the armor shop. Sure, buy a potion, go back, give it to him, and then lead him out. And that's before even talking about the bosses. <laughs> this. This game is bad on so many levels, but the soundtrack is amazing, and it's very, very Dragon Ball Z anime at times. Uh, Lagoon has a metric crap ton of problems, far more than it has good points, and yet, it's really compelling to play. <laughs> like, it should not be as good as it is. I, I think it's a terrible game, but I, there's something about it that's quite enjoyable. And it's only like a $10 game, which is kind of nice. Alright, next we have uh, Lennis which I believe is Paladin's Quest in English. Um, but again, find the Japanese version, I can apply a translation to it and get it for basically nothing. This is a first-person combat RPG, top-down exploration type affair. Uh, what really impressed me about this game, though, is it has like really nice pastel colors over everything. Like, everything just looks kind of like a almost sort of cross between Yoshi's Island and Earthbound sort of look. It's, it's a really nice kind of look to it. The game itself is, is pretty average, honestly, but uh, the sequel's apparently really, really good from what I heard, but uh, this game itself is, uh, well, it's an okay RPG. Like I said, I want to play all the RPGs on the system, so having a copy of Paladin's Quest, even if it's the Japanese version and I have to apply a patch, still, it's uh, it's a fun RPG and it's, uh, it's not bad, but that said, I think its most notable feature really is its art style. Alright, so we have, okay, now I've mentioned these before, but we'll continue on this little path. Uh, the five most necessary import RPGs for anyone importing for the Super Nintendo. We have this one, which is also the first reproduction card I've ever bought, Live Alive. And I've tried to review this two or three times. I'm going to get to it at some point because I really want to, but like my save data keeps getting like corrupted and like I lose all my footage and it's always a big thing. Live Alive is sort of like Saga except good. Like, I, I have problems with the Saga. I played one of the Saga games, and I proceeded to play for eight hours straight, and I never got any hint of story or any scene of combat in that game. Whereas Live Alive has, similarly to Saga, a bunch of different playable characters. All these are different playable characters. And the great thing is, each one of them has their own unique story that takes place in a different gameplay and thematic genre. Okay, they're, they're all RPGs, obviously, but they all play kind of differently. For example, the ninja plays kind of like a stealth game where you have to avoid, like, killing everyone or try and kill everyone to get bonuses as you infiltrate a castle. Uh, and he has a special ability that's like an invisibility cloak. Uh, next would be this guy, the cowboy. His whole thing is he is on a, I guess, kind of real-time strategy game. He's trying to defend a town, and he only has so much time to set up defenses for it. And uh, you can... Well, the extremes of it are you can either end up fighting two on one, the final boss, or like two on something like 40. So there, there's a bit of a difference. Uh, this guy, his his whole thing is basically a ripoff of Akira and he can read minds and his is really weird. Combat is odd. 
I forgot to mention this, the ninja's combat is entirely like environmental based, like you have ninjutsus that change like the environments and stuff. Uh, the robot, he's really cool because his story acts like a survival horror game, and there's actually no fighting in it whatsoever. Uh, the old Kung Fu Master, his entire thing is training an apprentice, so it's pretty much just training over and over and over. Uh, it's really, really interesting. There's one that plays like a fighting game. The thing is, with the exception of like the penultimate chapter, and you can choose all these chapters in any order you like, except for the penultimate one and the final one, obviously. Uh, none of them really play like just your bog standard RPG. There's no random encounters whatsoever, again, except for the last two chapters. It's really interesting how all these different people from different time zones and different genres end up sort of connecting at the end. And I think this is one of the coolest RPGs on the console. If you want an import RPG that's really interesting, this one's it. It has some issues, yeah, but uh, damn if Live Alive is not one of the coolest RPGs I think I've played on the system. Maybe period, it's, it's definitely a personal favorite of mine. All right, next we have a game that was on my game of the year list last year, a game I've been trying to get for a very long time, Lufia and the Fortress of Doom. Now this is a very historically important game and I actually found a blog recently about one, like the one guy who was responsible for this even coming out in North America because he just championed it so much. Seriously, if I can find it, I'll link it. If not, you're gonna have to look for it, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a story. But this is very historically important because this is a very early Super Nintendo RPG. It's very, very simple. Great soundtrack though, but it's a lot of fun. And you have to understand that back in the day when this came out, there was only like two other RPGs on the system, one of which was Final Fantasy IV. There, there really wasn't anything else out for North American markets and you know, this one came out and just to give you some like alternative is just great and it's a fantastic game. I'm looking so forward to finally getting to play the sequel or, or the prequel rather, but uh, uh, Luffy and the Fortress of Doom is a great little RPG. It's very, very basic, but it's a ton of fun. It's got a great story. And uh, it starts out really interestingly, like uh, during the adventures of your forefathers, like a uh, hundred years before the game starts, and then it sort of snaps to the beginning, and you kind of have to connect how that works, because like your ancestors killed like these horrible monsters that were like the kings of all evil or whatever, and now they're coming back, and you have to figure out why and how you got to stop them. I, I just absolutely adore Lufia. Uh, this is a pretty great game. Uh, and I'm actually running out of time on my camera, so I will be back after a memory card dump. But I'll be back in just a sec. Okay, next we have another import I got from that place with some really sweet custom art that was probably stolen. But uh, we have Magical Poppin. Uh, this is a fantastic little platformer that is exclusive to Japan. Also, I think this cover is fluorescent. It's, it's kind of really cool. Uh, it's um, it's a great little platformer. You play as Link's little sister. I believe her name is Princess. She's armed with a sword and like some bombs and a grappling hook and a bunch of other weapons you find along the way that all give you slightly different platforming experiences. And you just have to get through levels, defeat bosses. You know, it's standard hacky slashy platforming stuff. It's it feels very good except for the grappling. The grappling's a little bit awkward to get used to. But uh, I quite like this game a lot. I think its most notable feature, aside from the fact that it's very, very rare and hard to find in Japan, which is why I've got a repro, it's just more cost prohibitive to get an actual proper copy, is uh, that there were voice clips in this game provided by the late Ai Ijima, who was a Japanese adult film actress. Like, for some reason, that was one of the big selling points of this game for some reason. But uh, Magical Poppin is a great little import platformer if you can get it. I know I had to get a repro just because it was actually like more affordable. The repros are getting significantly more expensive as time goes on and more common, which is both good in some regards, but also concerning. I won't go into that too much, but I will say that purchasing this, this was the last one I purchased through these guys because uh, I bought about five from them over the course of my entire like business history with them and they started out really nice, you know, use PayPal, buy whatever, no worries, we'll get it to you super fast. And then when I bought this one, it got really, really sketchy, like they were saying, oh, well, uh, why don't you send us a bank order and like give us your phone number and then tell us a password and like it, it just got really sketchy. So once I got this, I just stopped ordering from them, but uh, Magical Poppin was totally worth it, I think. And I mean, I got Live Alive, and I got a few others from them that we'll see along the way. All right, next we have, ooh, 
we have Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse in Japanese. There was a trilogy of these in Japan, although we never got the third one until the Game Boy Advance. I still haven't found that one because that one's actually really expensive. But I played this when I was a kid. I rented it uh, again from my um, friend of my family's. And I think the version we got was kind of bugged because on the first level, like, you've got like this sort of Jack of the Beanstalk type of thing where you gotta like climb all these plants and like jump on tomatoes and like fly around using like these helicopter plants and stuff but for whatever reason every time I transitioned through that level it would put me in the same area again and again and again so I think my copy bugged when I first played it way back in the day and I kind of resented it for that but having played it again this game is a ton of fun as I grab a sip of water um, you got all these different costumes for Mickey to give him all these different abilities, to give him slightly different ways to platform around, and that will help you ultimately save your dog, Pluto, from Pete. And, uh, yeah. It's a solid little Capcom platformer starring Mickey Mouse, and, uh, that's, that's good. There's quite a few Mickey Mouse games on the Super Nintendo, although I don't have anywhere near all of them. Oh yeah, here's the sequel. This is Magical Quest 2 with Mickey and Minnie. New costumes, new characters, plus you can play as Minnie if you like. I think it has two player support as well, although I've never played it like that. Um, the Circus Mystery, the Great Circus Mystery as it says, because uh, in English, for some reason. Um, you know, if you like Magical Quest, this is the sequel. There was a third one, don't have it yet, I'm trying to get the full set. I know there's a Game Boy Advance version that was released in English, but I, you know, I got two on the Super Famicom, why not get the third eventually? That one's actually really hard to find. Um, but the third one stars Mickey and Donald, which is a little odd. I mean, it starts out as solo with Mickey, then with Mickey and Minnie, which kind of feels like a, a bit of a retread of that terrible NES Mickey and Minnie game that had Alice in Wonderland for some reason. And then it goes to Mickey and Donald. Sure, why not? But it's uh, a great platformer by Capcom, back when they were doing a lot of things that weren't just released in the same Street Fighter game over and over. Although they were doing it then too. We're not done with Disney games because we have one of the odder ones, Maui Mallard in Cold Shadows. So, if you haven't seen my review, go see my review, but uh, if this looks kind of like Donald Duck, it's because it is, except in North America where they completely removed any and all references to Donald Duck. Uh, everywhere else in the world, it was like Donald Duck was playing the part of Maui Mallard, who's like this like Magnum P.I. detective that like solves Hawaii-themed mysteries or something. But he also has an alter ego of Cold Shadow, which is this badass ninja. This is Donald Duck being a badass. Seriously, this game is worth it for that. Uh, that said, some of the levels are really, really tough. I remember the second level has like a boss where you have to fight like a clone, like uh, Daffy Duck Ninja for some reason. And he's got like a ridiculously good defensive game. So I, I remember this being pretty tough, but uh, the soundtrack to this game is amazing. Don't listen to my review for the soundtrack because that was on the Retron 3. It sounds terrible, but... Uh, Damn, the soundtrack to this game is really, really good. I, I think I've actually got some recorded somewhere. If I do, I'll, I'll put it as the background music here. If not, uh, I will have to do that in the future. But uh, again, it is a platformer starring Donald Duck as a badass ninja. That alone is totally worth it. I thought this was a Capcom game. It's not. It's a uh, Disney Interactive game. But uh, it's definitely one of the most noteworthy... Um, Donald Duck games out there. It's one of the most noteworthy Disney games because of just how completely off the rails strange it is, but it's definitely a lot of fun. And we're still not done because we have Mickey no Tokyo Disneyland Adventure. This is the Japanese exclusive one by Tomy. Uh, this is kind of like if you took Mickey Mouse platforming and you made it a Rocket Knight Adventure game. Basically, Mickey is equipped with a backpack with two tanks, one full of water, one full of helium, and balloons. You can fill balloons with water to use them as weapons or as uh, little springy platforms, or you can fill it with helium and use it as sort of like a jetpack type thing. Uh, the movement mechanics in this game are a lot of fun. They use these mechanics really, really well. However, there is not a lot of polish to this game. It is, It feels cheap in a lot of places. The platforming feels a little bit odd. It's, it's not the most well-polished game ever, but it is a fun game all the same. If you're finding imports for the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom and you see this one for cheap, it might be worth a pickup, but that said, it's far from the best. I think it's, it's a fun and definitely weird take on a Mickey Mouse game, especially for the time, because 
They were most pretty much entirely handled by Capcom at that point, but um, it's interesting to give Mickey a jetpack. <laughs> that alone is, is worth it for me just to explore that, but it's not the most well-made game. All right, next we have Mystic Arc, and I looked this up. This is the sequel to Brain Lord. The Seventh Saga came before that, and I think there's a PS1 port of Mystic Arc that came out afterwards, and that's the full series, so I've got two-thirds of it anyway. And this plays a lot like Seventh Saga, as I understand. I've never had a chance to play Seventh Saga, but it is a sort of turn-based RPG type thing. I haven't sunk a lot of time into this one either, but, uh, well, why would I? I've got Brain Lord. Brain Lord is the best of the set, but, uh, it's, it's very similar to Seventh Saga, as I've come to understand. You've got a bunch of different characters that play slightly differently. I, again, I'm, I'm running off memory, so if, if any of this is wrong, I apologize. But uh, I'll know once this is over and I have to record it. But, uh, you know, if you played Seventh Saga, you might want to look into Mystic Arc. I believe there is an English translation for this. Uh, I played this one a little bit without and then kind of put it down for a bit because I wanted to look for one and I just kind of never did. Um, but I guess I will for this uh, video. So that'll be fun. All right, next we have a game I misappropriated a few times when I was younger because I didn't quite know the name of this game, but it was one of two Taito games I had played growing up. This is a game I called the Ninja Warlords, but it's actually the Ninja Warriors, uh, or rather the Ninja Warriors again because it's the Japanese version, because uh, Ninja Warriors in North America is ridiculously expensive. And uh, so was this, actually. This was a little bit cheaper, though. But the cool thing about the Japanese version is it's uncensored. They have blood. They removed an enemy type from the English version because it was like a lady ninja. And again, it was sort of like how they changed poison in Japan to be just some guy in North America. Like, they just didn't want you beating up on vaguely feminine characters. So, um, yeah. But you got three different ninjas. You've got uh, Kunoichi, the sort of all roundy girl ninja. You've got Ninja, who's a big sort of hulking mass. And then unfortunately he was cut off by the label, which sucks because he's the coolest, but you've got Kamai Tachi, who's basically this ninja robot skeleton with blades for arms, hence his name, Sickle Weasel. Um, he has the attack human blender mode, which is the single greatest beat em up move of all time. Uh, ninja Warriors is not terribly great as, as a game. Um, it's a single plane beat em up. There's there's not really a lot of evasion or strategy to it, but it is a great game. And if you are interested in this game, you can get it for the PS4 as well as the Switch because it recently got a re-release. However, that said, that re-release is kind of weird. They added some new characters, which you would think would be the reason why to play that game, and yet those are locked behind beating the game several times. Uh, they added new animations, which for the most part looks great, except that my favorite character, Kamai Tachi, now looks like he's made out of jello, because, like, they over-animated him. Um, but there's a lot to like about the Ninja Warriors. Uh, and it's nice it did get a re-release, because even the Japanese copy, North American copy, every copy of the Super Nintendo game is ridiculously expensive and hard to find. But this was one of my favorite beat-em-ups, even though it's pretty subpar. It's a game I love with an absolute passion, so I needed to have a copy. And for the time, this is absolutely the best version of it. Now there's a new version out. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but I got a video on that one too. And finally, we have a game I've played all of, I think, three times, but uh, we have Pachio-kun Special. This is a pachinko RPG, sort of, basically. Uh, you play as Pachio Kun, whose kingdom has been overthrown, and he has to get really, really good at Pachinko to make a lot of money to buy it back or something. Uh, this is a Pachinko game, and I bought this really just because I import a lot of games, and at some point I was going to have to get a Pachinko game, and I actually have two or three now, as well as like horse racing games and Mahjong games. Importing, you're just going to get those games, so I figured let's, let's nip it in the bud and get this. Um, I'm thinking about making a video on Pachinko, honestly, but... I don't like Pachio Kun, like, like from a moral perspective, because Pachinko is inherently gambling. Gambling is illegal in Japan, but Pachinko, they kind of found a way to skirt it. Again, if I make a Pachinko video, I'll, I'll explain it, but uh, Pachio Kun is basically like an anthropomorphized Pachinko ball with one eyebrow for some reason that's supposed to make Pachinko appeal to kids to get kids into gambling. And I don't like that. As a game, this is pretty boring. A lot of pachinko games tend to be because it's really just find the sweet spot on the machine and just sort of let it sit there until you win. And this is not much different. I think there's only like one machine in this game and it just takes forever to actually hit your quotas to actually beat this game. So 
it's I can't really recommend it unless you really want to see kind of scummy gambling marketed towards kids or you really want to know something about much pachinko but there's better pachinko games out there trust me on that one um, but uh, anyway Apache Open special it didn't cost me much and it was more a cultural experience than anything even though it's one that kind of disgusts me a little bit but you know that's that's what it is anyway that is my third row of Super Nintendo and Super Famicom games we are now officially like halfway through them still got a long way to go holy crap but we're making progress so uh, I will once again recharge my battery because it's dying I'll get my next set and I will see you well for you in a second for me in probably like half a day or so but uh, let's keep going our next game panel de pawn on the Super Famicom. This was actually released in English under the name Tetris Attack and then later Pokemon Puzzle League, but uh, it's all the same game. You match three different falling blocks. I'm terrible at puzzle games, games involving falling blocks and like matching like designs on blocks, but uh, this is kind of where it came from. It also features Lip and her stick made famous from Smash, but otherwise it's just a really, really fun, if very simple puzzle game. That said, I'm terrible at this game and many, many games like it. But, you know, if you like nice little puzzle games, this one's not terribly expensive. And, you know, if you like Tetris Attack, this is the Japanese version. So, uh, it's, it's pretty good. Not really something I'm skilled with, but pretty good. Alright, next we have a game I reviewed way back in the day. We got Plock on the Super Nintendo. Now, Plock is a really interesting platformer because it takes a character that's basically prototype Rayman. He has the ability to throw his fists and other limbs as necessary, and he runs around trying to find his flag. That's, uh, that, that's the whole plot, but there's a ton of different gameplay in here. Like, halfway through the game, it changes mechanics slightly to becoming, like, exterminate X number of specific enemies. Uh, there's, a, like, a billion different power-ups. There's vehicles to ride, tons of different levels. This game is ridiculously hard though, and and even the developers have even stated this game is like just too ridiculously hard for its own good. Uh, this character only ever got this game, but he still exists today in that in uh, the creator's fan comic, which still exists, and uh, some fans have actually borrowed this character for their own fan games and stuff, so what I'm hearing is people really want more Plock, and I have to say, I kind of get why. It's got a tremendous soundtrack, uh, the only soundtrack I'm familiar with on the Super Nintendo that contains synth harmonica. And uh, it's a really, really fun game. The mechanics are a little bit janky, but, uh, you know, aside from the difficulty and the jank, it is a really, really fun game. It takes a lot of practice to actually, you know, get used to it and get good at it, but uh, I really like Plock a lot. Next game we have is... Ooh! Uh, which one is this? I believe this one is just simply Poppin' Twinbee, not uh, not uh, to be related to the other Twinbee game I've got. Uh, this is the Shmup Twinbee game. This got released in Europe as well, I believe, although it never came to North America. It is a really damn good Twinbee shooter. In fact, this is typically considered the best one on cartridge. That said, it came out around the same time of a Twinbee arcade game that was very, very similar and that absolutely blew this game out of the water. If you want that game, you have to get a Sega Saturn, and I recommend you do, because then you have to have a Sega Saturn. And, I mean, let's just be honest, the Sega Saturn is freaking awesome. That said, you've got uh, Twin B and Win B shooting a whole bunch of stuff, really bright, colorful, it's very cute, very, very difficult, and uh, I'm not very good with the whole power-up system, but Pop and Twin B actually sort of change the power-up system. If you're not familiar with this game, basically you shoot clouds to make little bells appear, then you shoot the bells a whole bunch of times, and after a while they turn into power-ups, until you shoot them again, and then they stop being power-ups. Now, fun story about me, the second time I went to college, I actually downloaded the original Twin B onto my 3DS, because it was available for that, because I wanted to try and actually get better. I played that every single day in between bus rides, and I never got better. This game actually adds a delay period between uh, your power-ups turning back into standard things if you shoot them again, which actually means that it's actually possible to get power-ups in this game. And I really appreciate that. Now, if you're a purist, you'll probably scoff at that say it's too easy to stop properly Twin B, but yeah, I'll, I'll take the not proper Twin B any day, honestly, if it means it's a hell of a lot more playable. 
Next game we have is one I've not played yet, and a game I'm not terribly familiar with. I also have to clean this cartridge, but uh, Populous. Uh, this is a game my girlfriend swears by, although um, not necessarily this version. I don't know. I've never played it. I believe this was high concept Peter Molyneux before he was given just free reign to go insane and overhype every game he ever made. You know, the days of black and white and all that. Um, it's like a god game sim strategy game from what I can tell. I'm not super familiar with it, but I've seen lots and lots of footage of it. This was actually made available in North America, but uh, this came in a bundle along with, uh, what was it, Alkahest. So for the value of basically just free, I took it. Why not? Uh, I'm going to have to play it for this, and that'll be my first time ever playing Populous. I'm kind of excited. Alright, this came in a bundle with a bunch of other games, including Arrow the Acrobat, and I was really excited about this game, and then I had to play it, unfortunately. This is Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt. It is an Adams Family game, and I'm not really all that familiar with the Adams Family. Like, I just don't get it. I watched the, like, live-action reboot, like, in the early 2000s, and I just don't understand uh, the Adams Family. It's, it's just not something that appeals to me at all. But that said, I saw gameplay of this when I was a lot younger on some gameplay show. I, I think it was like uh, VNA Top 10 or something like that. And it looked like a very technically impressive game. Like, I, I remember there being a level where like 90% of the screen was just not playable, but you had to like use this very small center bit of a screen, which is like a crystal ball to like navigate your path. That looked very technically impressive. And playing it again, it absolutely is. However, this game is ridiculously hard and awkward to play. Uh, it is wildly unforgiving. I don't think there's too much like post damage and vulnerability, and there's a lot of enemies that come at you real, real fast, which is not necessarily ideal. And I know this because I've actually tried to capture gameplay footage of this game like three or four times, and every time I end up dying like within four minutes and just kind of give up. But, uh, I mean, I guess this time I'm actually going to do it, because I need it for this thing. Uh, anyway, Pugsley Scavenger Hunt. It's a very cool-looking game, it's a very technically impressive game, but it's not necessarily the most fun, unless you're very hardcore and very dedicated to actually getting good, because it is very difficult and really awkward. Still, I think it's a pretty impressive game in a lot of respects. Alright, our next game is... Ooh, this one's a pretty important game. We have, uh, Ron Man One Half. This is the first of three run, well, one half fighting games on the Super Famicom and Super Nintendo. Uh, and we did actually get this game in North America, but like damn near every other anime game at the time, except for Golgo 13, as we established, uh, they completely took all the anime out of this. Instead, just made it like a really, really generic fighting game. Also, I have to apologize for the footage of this not looking too well. Uh, I've tried to record footage of this once or twice before, and it always looks like crap. I think it's just the way the interlacing works with this game, I'm genuinely not sure, but my recording equipment does not like this game. Um, it has a kind of an awkward fighting style, it's got like a dedicated jump button, a dedicated block button, it's got like a dedicated button for everything. And if I recall, this was the game where if you want to play multiplayer, which I, I've only ever done once with my buddy Caleb, and I've got a video of that, go watch that, you have to input a code to play more than just the matchup of Ranma and Ranma, which is like their Ryu and Ken, just, you know, the same character over and over. Uh, it's it's kind of weird that you're stuck using, like, the generic character over and over, and you have to input a code to do otherwise, but uh, it was their first whack at a Ranma one-half fighting game, and it would not be the last. Alright. Next, and this will shock you, but we have, as it says, SUP, Ranma one-half, hard battle. This as you can see by the cover, is an actual Ranma one half fighting game that came to the Super Nintendo without the anime removed. Thank you, you know, Dragon Power for removing all the Dragon Ballness from it. And uh, this plays basically exactly like the last one because it's a sequel to it, except that they added a bunch of characters, they added a lot of detail, and they just added a whole mess of quality. <laughs> it still plays the same, but it looks better, sounds better, plays a little bit better, but it's still got that sort of like janky, dedicated control scheme. I like this game a lot. There are three Ranma one half fighting games on the Super Nintendo. It's really tough for me to claim one is the best of the lot, because like, I think this one is the truest essence of Ranma one half in a fighting game. 
whereas the first one's just kind of awkward and uh, I don't want to say bad, but awkward and bad compared to the other two. And then the third one plays the best, but it feels like too much of a generic fighter and loses the spirit of Ranma one half. This one still has the awkward goofiness of a guy who turns into a girl when he's splashed with water, a guy who turns into a pig when he's splashed with water, a guy who turns into a panda when he's splashed in the water, and just insanity ensuing with all of them. Um, you know, this this was literally my intro to Ranma one half was these fighting games and the video I made like two years ago. Again, go see that. Really, really good video, I think. But, uh, you know, this was my intro to the series and I kind of immediately fell in love with it. <laughs> And, uh, you know, this game might not play perfectly because it's still got that awkward fighting game scheme that the previous one had, but it's got the heart. And it feels like it's improved in a bunch of ways, so I quite like this one a lot. And next, this will completely shock you, but we have the third one. <laughs> uh, this is the third one. Uh, this is the one everyone will say is probably the best out of the lot because it plays the best out of the lot and it probably looks the best as well. Uh, this one throws away the entire completely unique control scheme of the others with like a dedicated jump and a block button and like two attack buttons and instead opts to basically use the Street Fighter control scheme because Street Fighter 2 got really famous around this time. So everything's like done with quarter circle movements and all that and I'm awful at that sort of thing. Like I I've said that once before, you know, with um, uh, what was it, uh, Blaze Blue with one of my loot videos, go watch that video as well. But you know, I, I'm not good at putting intricate motions into controls just because my hands have never been good. I've never had a ton of great dexterity. So stuff like that isn't all that great for me. But that said, of the lot, this is the most traditional playing because it decided to take the gameplay style of something that did it much better. And it looks and sounds great. It's probably got the best sprites in the entire series, but it feels a little bit generic. Like every character's stage is just a different place in the world as opposed to, you know, like actual places in the whole series, because the whole series only took place in like, you know, a local neighborhood with one or two like exceptions. Whereas this one, it's like, well, one person's fighting in New York, one person's fighting in London, one person's fighting in Japan. Uh, I do appreciate that uh, Ryoga fights at the South Pole because, you know, that's, that's a good reference, but otherwise it just feels a little generic. Uh, that said, even though this isn't Japanese, there is an English translation which calls this Hard Battle 2, I believe. I think I actually have that on my uh, Retro Freak, which I'll be recording off of, I guess. But uh, this game is pretty good. It's it's a lot more expensive than the previous two, unless you're buying an English Hard Battle. But uh, Hard Battle 2, it's harder to find than the other two, but it is, by today's standards, probably the best of the three. I'm not sure I like it the best, but it's probably the best in terms of functionality. All right, next we have, oh god, this piece of garbage. This was a game I reviewed way back in the day. A game I have thought about sending back because there is an actual rental store address on this that I'm sure doesn't even exist anymore. We have Rise of the Robots, a game so shameful it, it can't actually appear behind all the stickers. Also, we have uh, a location of Got It Video from somewhere in uh, VA, which I guess is Virginia. You know, if, if that place still exists, let me know, and maybe I'll send them back their really, really crappy fighting game. But uh, this game is awful. I reviewed it way back in the day. Uh, I think during that Ronmo one half fighting game video, I showed this off with my buddy Caleb, so, you know, you can go watch that as well. But um, this is a weird fighting game because they amped it up, like, and, and they promoted the ever-living crap out of it. They promoted a book which came out. They promoted toys, a TV show, several sequels. None of it came out except for the book, yeah, and that's because this game came out and it was awful. Um, it's it, it boasted having like learning AI enemies, which is not true. Um, it boasted enemies that learn your style, they get better, and they are functionally like really really tough to fight characters and stuff. Uh, with the exception of one character who has a reach of three quarters of the entire screen. Uh, you can beat every enemy by just kicking them into the corner, and they will do nothing. And the only difference between enemies really is that every different enemy you fight progressively through the ladder, and it's it's not randomized or anything, they all get a little bit more health and a little stronger than the previous one. And what's great is if you're a tournament person, uh, player one will always play as the generic main character, who at about halfway through the game gets matched with an AI, and then after that they all greatly outpace him. Whereas 
player two can pick any character they want, including the final boss if they put it in a code. So yeah, I you could be playing the main character who sucks after the halfway point, and uh, your opponent could pick the final boss who has like four times as much health and damage than you. Fun. Ugh. Yet yeah, another reason why I hated robot games growing up. Okay, our next game is a better robo game that I wish I had when I was a kid. We have Robotrek, a game that is getting a lot rarer and more expensive. And it's a damn shame because it's a really good game. It is an RPG by uh, Quintet and Enix. In fact, if I recall, this game takes place on the planet Quintet Enix. Sure. And you play a kid who looks suspiciously like Dexter from Dexter's Lab, building robots to fight things like giant sentient crabs and uh, enemy robots from the future and stuff. It is a game that in Japan is known as slapstick, and that kind of clues you in with how much it takes itself seriously, in that it doesn't. It is a ridiculously goofy game. I've been wanting to Let's Play this for a while, actually, because it is a lot of fun. But that said, it is wildly unbalanced. I can't remember the exact formula, because it's been a while since I played it, but... I, I said this in my review back in the day. Uh, the first time I played this game, I ran into a situation where I could basically be unkillable, because uh, each of the robots has like a specialty, and the first one is defense. So if you stick all your points into defense on the first one, and then just like equip your second one with any weapon, uh, the first robot will never die and the second robot will kill everything. <laughs> uh, I remember this game not being well balanced, and it was really easy to break that balance. But uh, that said, Robotrek on the Super Nintendo, if you're collecting RPGs on the system, uh, this is one to look out for, because it's not quite your traditional RPG for sure. I quite like it a lot. And uh, the battle system kind of reminds me a bit of a Nindo, which is good. Alright, this time we have yet another one of the five most needed and absolutely necessary import RPGs. We have uh, Rudra no Hijo, or Treasure of the Rudras. Uh, this is a RPG that contains several different playable characters that try and like fight fate or something. It's been a while since I played this, I'm not going to lie. But what really stuck out to me about this game was the fact that it had like one of the most innovative magic systems I could ever think of. Uh, basically, while you play, you can see enemies use like spells and whatever, and you get your own little spell book with words and stuff. But to like actually use magic, you don't level up and gain spells. You just write uh, a series of words into your magic book and then cast it. So basically, you could run into any enemy in the world, like say the final boss, and use like the ultimate attack spell. If you remember the words he incited, you can then incite them yourself and use like the ultimate attack spell yourself. And that strikes me as being really, really interesting. And along with Bahamut Lagoon, this is probably one of the most beautiful games in terms of sprite work I've seen on the system. I, I hesitate to think of another one aside from Bahamut Lagoon, which again is like top tier. These two share that crown. And as of now, we have talked about two thirds of the most necessary import RPGs for the system. Um, but uh, Treasure of Rudra, that is an amazing little RPG. Alright, next we have a game that I owe a lot of thanks to my girlfriend for. We have Run Saber. This was my most wanted Super Nintendo game for the longest time. Uh, the short version is, this is basically the Super Nintendo equivalent of Shinobi. Shinobi, uh, Strider, that's the one. It's ninja stuff, there's, there's a lot of them. <laughs> I apologize. It's by Atlas which means that it's going to be great, and it is. Uh, you pick one of two Strider knockoffs, a boy or a girl, and you run around flipping around, killing things. You've got basically the screw attack, a laser sword, uh, basically everything you need to take out anyone and everyone. Uh, all the bosses are really, really cool. I remember this game getting really hard, but it is also a lot of fun. I've got a review of this game, and it was one of my most... Uh, favorite games of the year I got this without a doubt. Run Saber is an absolute must have game especially if you like Strider because the Super Nintendo of course didn't get Strider that was exclusive to the Genesis. We got this and while I don't think it's quite as good it's pretty close. I, I like Run Saber a lot. Unfortunately it is really rare and hard to find and expensive. Which is why I have to once again give a big thank you to my girlfriend for setting up the show with a copy because I've been looking for one for pretty much since I started like collecting Super Nintendo games for the show. It was 
one of my most wanted ones. And again, I'm running out of space, so I'll be back after I clear my memory card. All right, our next game is Ruin Arm. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to dump on Seeker of Mana, talking about how the AI pathfinding and the fact that you have to stick near your team is awful. And granted, it absolutely is. Uh, but this game makes that look absolutely masterful because it does it about a billion times worse. Uh, the plots of this game, I have no idea what the plot is actually. Uh, I made up my own plot, which I guarantee is about a billion times better, and I will let you know what that is once I start to review this game at some point. But uh, uh, you got two characters that can execute special attacks and can't get too far away from each other. They get stuck on everything. It is really infuriating. And yet... In spite of all that, I still think it's a pretty enjoyable experience. Well, I, I enjoyed it anyway, but to be fair, I enjoyed it as sort of like a B-grade, really bad Japanese RPG. Uh, if you could translate it and actually figure out what's going on in this game, you'd probably enjoy it a lot more, obviously, but um, it's it's not great. It's, it's a pretty awkward game. It feels like someone sort of tried to take a stab at how Secret of Mana acted, but instead was programmed by a walrus who had never learned how to code properly. And uh, that's Ruin Arm for you. But uh, it's another RPG to add to the collection, which, seeing as I want to play them all, that's important to me. All right, next we have a really important import, an absolute must-have if you're collecting Super Famicom games. We have Sanrio Smash Ball, the original Smash. Uh, this is basically kind of like Pong with the Hello Kitty characters. Uh, basically, you've got like a puck flying around that you have to hit super hard and get into your opponent's goal zone. It is an absolute blast to play. It is a very simple game, but it's great. There's also another game called Pop and Smash, which I think was trying to steal the glory of this game a little bit because it's a lot the same. But uh, I got to play that one yet. But um, Sanrio Smash is the original Smash. It is a ton of fun. Weirdly enough, for a Sanrio game, you can't actually play as Hello Kitty, though. She's just the referee. And I don't recognize any of the other Sanrio characters except for Kuropi, so um, that's that's who I ended up playing as. But uh, Sanrio Smash, if you're into interesting sports-ish games, or just fun multiplayer, or just really neat imports, you should get it, but it is going up in price a fair bit. Alright, the next one we have is... SD Night Gundam Monogatari. Uh, this is the SD Night Gundam game for the Super Nintendo, obviously, um, based on the SD Night Gundam anime that shortly existed for a few episodes. It was a good anime for what it's worth. Um, but this game is a little weird because I'm not 100% sure, but on the Famicom they released three SD Night Gundam games. I think, and I there's genuinely no information about any of these games, but I think this is a compilation of the three, sort of trying to tell the entire Night Gundam story, at least as far as I can tell. This is sort of a Dragon Quest style RPG that also has like card battle game nonsense. I haven't played this one very much, but again, it's an RPG I kind of want to have. Plus I love Gundam, plus I built the Night Gundam, so I figured you know, I like the Night Gundam story, I might as well get the Night Gundam games, and I kind of wanted to get the Famicom ones as well. But this is a good start. And, uh, you know, if you like Japanese RPGs on the Super Nintendo, there are a lot of them. And that is one of them. This one is one made in North America. Secret of Evermore. In fact, this is the only one that was made by Squaresoft's uh, US branch, because I'm pretty sure they made this game and then kind of closed down as far as I can tell. Um, this game is kind of like Secret of Mana, except it's just one player character and his dog as opposed to a team of three. And you basically go into like this weird virtual reality world that is multiple different worlds uh, that sort of take place in different time zones. Like there's a caveman era, there's sort of like a sort of Elizabethan sort of like high fantasy knights in armor sort of era. There's a futuristic space fantasy sort of era. It, it's really cool, and your dog changes form depending on which area you're in, which I think is a really cool touch. Plus, there's Final Fantasy IV references all over the place in here. Uh, I like this game a lot, although I don't like it as much as Secret of Mana. Secret of Evermore is definitely an interesting game, and if you like Secret of Mana, it's worth checking out, I think. Besides, it's like the only North American-made Square Enix game. 
it's it's worth it just for that historical bit. All right, next we have another game in the top five most needed, necessary Super Famicom RPG imports. We have the other first game I ever made a repro with, along with Live Alive, we have Secret of Mana 2. This game would now be known as Trials of Mana, but uh, this is Seiken Den Sets 3, the sequel to Secret of Mana, although there's basically no story connection. And uh, I'm not sure I necessarily like it as much as Secret of Mana because this game does some things better. Like for one thing, you can pick a party of three characters from a total of six, which is pretty cool. However, there's only three story paths. Each character shares their story path with another character, including the final boss. And this leads to something I don't like about it, which is, um, spoilers, but somewhere down the line of the story, you kind of get to a point where everyone is clamoring for like the ultimate MacGuffin of the story. And you end up running into two of the three final bosses because you know, their stories are happening in parallel to yours, of course. And they end up sort of whining, talking about how they're not really evil and how they're actually good people and they're, they're kind hearted and they're, they're good intentioned. But the person who's your final boss, he's definitely evil and you gotta kill him. But you know, if you were playing any other character, it would just be swapped around and that kind of takes away any sort of impact any of the villains actually has. And the fact that it has to make way for three villains as opposed to just having one centralized villain that all the stories connect to, it, it kind of means that it has to sort of half-ass all the enemies, which really sucks. Uh, other things I don't like is combat is way slower. Uh, each of the characters has a different combat speed, which is kind of cool, but uh, combat just generally moves a lot slower. Once you get into combats, um, you sort of move at a combat pace which means you start slowly moving around. You can't start running until every enemy on screen is killed. So you kind of have to like shuffle around and leave if you just don't want to fight things, especially if you're backtracking through like level one enemies at level 50, excuse me. Um, yeah, that's not a lot of fun. What I do quite like though, is the fact that every character does have their own story a little bit, even though the story paths are largely all the same. And every character has class changes that gives every character like a different potential for what their class could be. Like the main character starts out as a knight, but he could be a paladin or a duelist, which means he could either focus on healing and become sort of a mage knight or like just a pure all out attacker. Um, that said, there are some really bad class combinations in this game. I started with a um, the, the knight as probably like a pure offensive attacker. I picked the offensive mage and then like a support attacker and my team had no healers. I, I was just spamming healing items the entire playthrough. That was not particularly fun. Um, that said, you don't have to deal with the AI pathfinding of Secret of Mana, so that's that's a plus. But uh, Secret of Mana 2, you can now get it officially as of last year as part of the Mana Collection and as a remake that is coming out next month, April, coming out in April. So about next month. I'm pretty excited about it. Hoping it's going to be a lot better than it was. Now, the next game we have on our list, and the last one of this row is Seiken Den Sets 3. This game would also be known as Secret of Mana 2, or also now Trials of Mana, and was that thing what I just talked about. Uh, you're probably wondering why I have a Japanese copy, and the short answer was it was an additional 30 cents on an order, and I really, really like this game because I love the Mana series. Secret of Mana is a very near and dear game to my heart. And to have an official Japanese copy, in addition to my reproduction, you know, I, I just thought it'd be fun to collect. And it cost basically nothing. But uh, that said, it's the same game that I just talked about. And uh, that is my, at this point, fourth row of Super Nintendo stuff. I still have like another two rows coming, so uh, just hang in there. I will pull it off my shelf and I will start recording this tomorrow, but for you to be in a few seconds. But I will see you then. All right, our next game is a little RPG I was looking for for a very long time. We have Shadowrun. Uh, this is based on an old tabletop RPG that I don't really know anything about. There was a Genesis version that was as well, as well as an Xbox 360 first person shooter, and now there's like a PC revival of the thing. Uh, they're all completely different games. But I spent a long time looking for this game, and honestly, I got a little bit stuck. I haven't spend as much time with this one just because I got stuck really early on but it has sort of like a cyberpunk feel like it's very very futuristic very sort of Blade Runner you wake up in a morgue that your you know brain was fried and supposedly you're dead but you're back to life because there's like magic as well as 
you know, cybernetics and stuff like that. And you have to go run around and like solve the murder mystery, figure out how you died, figure out like your past and stuff. Again, I didn't get very far. Uh, you can see my gameplay footage of this game and that's about as far as I ever got with this game. I got to a point where I got like a phone number and then there was like a phone next to the guy that had the phone number but I couldn't use it. And then I went to like a billion other phones and I couldn't interact with them so I don't know. But uh, I gotta spend a lot more time with Shadowrun. I was way too excited and spent way too much on it because this game is really expensive. But uh, I found a copy of Shadowrun last year and uh, I was pretty excited. So far, it has not lived up to the hype, but again, I haven't spent enough time with it. I uh, didn't care so much for the combat from what I remember, though. It was like real time, but it felt like it needed to be a little bit turn-based to like reload weapons and stuff, based on what I remember. Uh, anyway, next game we have Shonen Ashibe, based on what I believe is a manga and an anime about some kid and his pet seal thing. I reviewed this way back in the day. It is kind of a weird platformer. It's got some really nice cute things to it. For example, your little seal guy has like four different animations for standing on an edge depending on like how far he's standing on the edge and the direction he's facing and stuff like that. Uh, tons of nice little details like that. Unfortunately, as a platformer, it's not that great. Basically, you go into any level and you have to collect a whole bunch of different things before you can leave. And some of the things are right out in the open, others involve interacting with the environment. It's a very cute game, but it's how you interact with the environment that doesn't necessarily work. I think level 2 had like these hippos that would throw basketballs at you and you had to like score baskets with them, but the hit detection on it was so awful that it was just awkward to try and make it. Um, this is not exactly what you would consider the single most stellar platformer of all time, but that said, you know, for a cheap import, I might suggest checking out this game because it is fun and it's got some neat little aesthetic details, plus a tremendous soundtrack. But uh, as a game, just from a sheer gameplay perspective, it's pretty, pretty rough. Our next game I got last year thanks to my lovely girlfriend. We have Sim Irath, The Living Planet. This is a very ambitious game. Basically, it is a planet environmental, like, simulator you start off with a planet and then you have to like cultivate life from bacteria to dinosaurs and stuff and you can end up with some really interesting stuff you can end up with like flying whales and all sorts of crazy stuff uh, what really interested me about this game is I remember reading a forum post on game facts that mentioned someone had played this game somehow created like these sentient nanobot robots that then you sort of waged war on themselves because they became like super religious or something created nuclear winter so they couldn't live on the planet, they took off to space, the planet somehow regenerated after X period of time, then a race of plant people somehow came to life, and then the robots came back and nuked them. <laughs> and when I heard that I said to myself, I need to play this. Unfortunately this is a very very complex PC game, it came with a manual about the size of a phone book if I recall. And it is really just a victim of the console it was on because it was way too ambitious for the Super Nintendo hardware to really pull off, especially to the degree that they probably were going for. Like, you can feel the ambition with this one, but it just feels like it needs to explain itself a lot better, and it could just be a lot clearer. But if you like strategy games and you like something a little bit different, this is an interesting little chill game, but uh, don't expect too much from it. Next we have another game I got as a birthday, birthday, Christmas present. I got this as a Christmas present during my second term in college. Uh, we have Skyblazer on the Super Nintendo, like many of the other games. And this is another game by Sony, which is a weird logo to once again see on a Nintendo console. But this is a tremendous little platformer that does like everything. And it actually does it relatively well, all things considered. It is a fairly smooth platformer, it's got like mode 7 flying sequences, it's got side scrolling flying sequences, it's got sort of a beat em up aspect to it, as well as classics like platforming, plus it goes into like I believe Hindu sort of mythology with Ajura and like uh, all sorts of different other stuff. I really like this game, I think it's great, it needs a lot more refinement than what it got, but if you can find this I think this one is a must have. I literally got this, I think, at the tail end of when any Super Nintendo game was remotely affordable, and even then it was pretty hard to find. So um, when, I believe it was my mother who bought this for me for Christmas that year, 
when she grabbed it, that was like the last time you could ever find something quite like Skyblazer for a decent price. And I believe I got this with Brain Lord. Um, and that was a really cool set of presents to get for Christmas, I will say that, as a fan of the Super Nintendo. Alright, next we have a Super Famicom game. We did get in English, but unfortunately I didn't have a copy of it. Uh, we have a Japanese copy. We have Soul Blader, which we know as Soul Blazer. This is the prequel to Illusion of Gaia, and this will actually create an interesting theme that you'll see later. But uh, this is a very early action RPG for the system. It actually borrows a lot of sound effects and visual stuff from Act Razor, which is by the same team, I believe. Uh, including, once again, that legendary starry background that I love so much. And uh, the same, your character gets hurt sound effects and like the same swords ringing, ha, sound effects. Uh, you'll hear it all in here. What's really cool about Soul Blader is it's about recreating the world around you. Like you come into this area and it's like completely desolate. You go into a dungeon, you start like freeing stuff and the world slowly gets built up again around you. Uh, what's interesting is all three games in the Super Nintendo trilogy at least sort of take that theme in slightly different ways. But you can almost see this like a prototype of Dark Cloud in a lot of respects. And also in the respect that it's a really fun action RPG. I like this game a lot but nowhere near as much as Illusion of Gaia. But that said, if you can find Soul Blazer, it's a pretty fun game. Just bear in mind, it does reuse a lot of stuff from other games, and it is a fairly early RPG for the system. All right, next we have Super Chinese Land 2. This was, uh, I believe, translated to English as Galactic Defender, the sequel to like Super Ninja Brothers or something like that. I've never played any of those games. I really wanted to. This is the only one I have, though. They're really hard to find. But it's a culture blur, uh, culture blame, culture brain, sort of beat em up RPG type thing. I haven't gotten very far in this because it's entirely in Japanese. And well, I believe there was an English release planned for this. The translation never actually finished. Um, so I, I don't have any way to actually play this with knowing what's supposed to be going on, but uh, It's an interesting little like kung fu beat-em-up turned RPG type of thing and For like 30 cents, which you know, it's it's an import Super Famicom game. It's not gonna cost very much I think that was not a bad little purchase. I think it was okay That said, you know, I probably enjoyed a lot more if I actually understood what was going on in it But uh, that's that's just me hazarding a guess all right, next we have Super Draken. Now, despite what that name might incline you to believe, this is not just a Super Famicom version of Draken. This is actually its sequel, Dragon View. And this is the only way for me to actually get a copy of Dragon View because Dragon View is rare and expensive. Whereas the Japanese Super Draken is relatively cheap. And having something like the Retro Freak or Retron 3, I can just apply a translation to it and play it in English. And uh, I said this in my review of it, which you should go watch, but uh, the only thing this game really ever did wrong was that it tried to be Draken. <laughs> because aside from the, once again, kind of admittedly advanced sort of Mode 7 3D map, nothing about this game resembles the previous game. Instead of being sort of an awkward, clunky RPG where nothing is explained to you, it's a 2D beat-em-up with some really fun mechanics, and the only thing I really don't like about the beat-em-up mechanics in this game is like there's three weapons, if I recall correctly. And this game has like one weapon that's totally unique to it, which is kind of like a boomerang type weapon. Uh, again, I believe it has been a long time since I've played this. I'm working off memory here. But I remember that that weapon is like the one you really want to use because it's so interesting and fun. And half the enemies like just crawl on the ground way below where you throw it so you can't actually hit them. It sucks because it's like the best weapon in the game and it's certainly the most interesting and you just can't use it for like half the things, but it's sort of your standard, you know, your girl gets kidnapped, go rescue her sort of thing. But it's still a really fun game and, you know, if you liked Draken, you'll probably love this game and if you didn't like Draken, you'll probably still love this game, although you might find the map bits a little bit tedious. At least stuff is explained better in this game. And, you know, that is ultimately the important thing because Draken was just kind of a confusing, I don't want to say mess, but, um, I'm, I'm having trouble coming up with a better term than mess. Alright, next we have what is probably the single greatest official multi-cart ever released. We have Super Mario All-Stars plus Super Mario World. The original Super Mario All-Stars was available, at least in North America, as a free giveaway for Nintendo Power subscribers. 
This was an actual release later that contained Super Mario World, which, granted, isn't really doing much, seeing as that came with the console usually, but that said, if you didn't have those individual games, you got so much awesome Mario goodness. First of all, you got Mario All-Stars, which was the original Mario Brothers, the Japanese Mario Brothers 2, the English Mario Brothers 2, as well as Mario 3, all in revamped visuals that actually look like Super Mario World, though very different. And then in this one, you also get Super Mario World. So it's basically every single awesome Mario game all in one. You know, every single awesome 2D Mario game anyway. And uh, this is a very expensive con uh, console, very expensive cartridge. But if you're a fan of Mario, this one is absolutely a must have because it has so much going for it. And if nothing else, it's an amazing collectible to have. And of course, it's the best official multi-cart ever made. Like, I, I can't think of any other multi-cart that's official that was half as good as this. But uh, it's a pretty amazing game, I think. Okay, the next game we have. Um, I'm terrible with puzzle games. Like, I don't claim to be a very smart person. I'm awful at puzzle games. But the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom had just this amazing collection of puzzle games like it had like uh, Dr. Mario plus Tetris and it had uh, an even better version of Warriors Woods and an even better Yoshi's Cookie and I really want to get those but I figured if I was going to start collecting puzzle games it would be only right to collect this this is Super Tetris 2 plus Blumbliss and that right there says it's the limited edition version now I'm not sure if the limited edition actually means anything in the sense that it's you know more collectible or anything I just know that there's two versions of Super Tetris 2 plus Blumbliss uh, the regular one being basically identical, except it has a red label, it doesn't have this little fancy thing that says limited edition, and the individual puzzles on the cartridge are different, otherwise it's an identical game. There was also Super Tetris 3 Plus Bombless, which was the sequel to this obviously, but uh, you get Tetris, which I think everyone knows what it is, plus Bombless, which is kind of like Tetris, except all your Tetris pieces contain bombs. And if you line up a bomb on a completed row, it'll actually take out a bunch of uh, the pieces alongside it. However, it won't necessarily take out the whole row. You have to combine bombs to do that, or merge them into even bigger bombs by creating a block of them. There's a lot of strategy to this, and it gets really, really hectic really fast, but at the same time, it is a really rockin' puzzle game. And even I'm actually kind of good at bombless just because the explosive aspects can take out a lot of stuff. Plus, as this weird logo indicates, it was by BPS, Bulletproof Software, or, as the cool kids like to call it, BIPS. And BIPS put out quite a few really, really fun puzzle games for the Super Nintendo. Alright, next we have another game that I got along with Arrow the Acrobat. This one I don't know a ton about, but I played it once. Uh, we have Super Widget. And this is a tie-in with a TV show as well as there being an NES game that serves as a prequel to this game. Unfortunately, I'm not really familiar with the NES version, and I'm not really familiar with the cartoon. Like, looking at this character, he looks familiar, like maybe I watched the opening once when I was a kid, but I genuinely don't know anything about Widget. I played this game once for like a what the hell is, and it seems like a very interesting, very fun platformer. It's just not something I'm super, super familiar with. But I'm gonna have to play it again for footage for this, so that'll be fun. Uh, that said, I quite liked my time with it. It seemed like a very interesting, different kind of platformer, and it didn't just seem like one that was just trying to push a mask off, which is always appreciated. And of course, that little emblem on the side, Atlas, means that it's going to be pretty damn snazzy. All right. Next we have, ooh, Tengai, Makio Zero, Far East of Eden Zero. Um, this is a game I wish that had an English translation, unfortunately it doesn't. Also, it's a cartridge that makes me really, really happy. I've got like the Retro Freak, because the battery in this one is dead, which is a shame. But it is an RPG with some really interesting mechanics. First of all, it has a date and time system, a calendar system, um, serious a series of events can occur and like special like festivals can happen on certain dates. Basically think the date and time calendar system of Pokemon Silver just significantly earlier. 
and uh, you get a relatively rockin' RPG for it. Uh, it's got a, it seems to anyway have a pretty interesting little set of, sense of humor. If you lose the tutorial area, it like throws you into like a recursive time loop to try again and again and again. It's weird. Uh, the characters are really, really goofy. I think this is a great game. Really hoping it gets translated to English at some point because I'm very excited to give this one a shot. But uh, I got a little bit in and then I realized, oh, my entire day's worth of gameplay was gone just because of no save data. But that said, I've got equipment now that preserves my save data, so maybe I'll give it another go. Alright, you might recall how I got Demon's Crest for free when I bought a different game with it. Well, here it is. TMNT4, Turtles in Time. I gotta thank my girlfriend for setting up this purchase for me. This is the second best beat-em-up of all time. Uh, and I've actually got some history with TMNT. See, my uncle owned an NES back in the day, and I got to play it once or twice a year. And he happened to have TMNT 2, the arcade game. Uh, I didn't realize that was the second game in the series at that time, but uh, I played that a lot, and he had a couple other games I really liked, but that was the one that really stood out to me, that and Jackal. But um, when I was a kid, I also knew this other kid, and he was, I don't want to say a friend. He, he really wasn't. He was basically just like the biggest jerk you could ever imagine. And what he'd like to do is he'd like to make me deals. Like, he'd like to basically say, oh, just, you know, let me borrow this and you can have this or whatever. And really, he was just scamming me out of all my stuff. But one of his deals was to let me play uh, Turner, uh, the TMNT on the NES, because I didn't have one. Well, he had the original, which was a terrible piece of crap, and I absolutely hated it. And, well, I, I hated pretty much everything he ever scammed me on, and I'm still bitter about that, but... There's a reason why it all ties into this. See, I ended up seeing Turtles in Time at my local rental shop, and I was really hesitant to play because I wasn't sure if I was going to get the awesome beat-em-up that my uncle had, or that crappy platformer thing that that jerk had. And uh, it turns out it was neither. It was a completely different beat-em-up that was kind of one of the best games on the system. <laughs> uh, it's like the best beat-em-up at the time I'd ever played. Second best beat-em-up of all time, as far as I'm concerned right now. But uh, now I've got a copy, and that's great because I was a big Turtles fan when I was a kid. Uh, I always watched the cartoon. It, it started my massive uh, fandom of Cam Clark's voice acting career <laughs> as uh, my boy Leonardo. Uh, and, you know, I, I even dressed up as a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle once for Halloween when I was a kid. I even had a turtle shell backpack to keep all my candy in. And that was all because of, uh, well, the cartoon, but also this amazing game. Uh, this is an amazing game that I have a lot of history with, and to have a copy, it, uh, it means a lot to me to have this. And I'm already running out of time on my memory card, so I will be back in a sec. And uh, we'll continue. Okay, and next we come to the final of the five big super important import RPGs you absolutely need to own if you're importing and you like RPGs. We have Terranigma. This is the third game in the series with Illusion of Gaia and Soul Blazer. Um, a lot of people say this is the end of a trilogy, but there was a PS1 game that, uh, unfortunately, the name presently escapes me, and that really bothers me, because I was thinking really hard about it before I recorded this, but uh, unfortunately, it is beyond my current memory. That said, there were four games, but this is like the previous two. It is a top-down um, hack and slash action RPG with the theme of building the world around you. Now, if you were in Europe, you are very, very lucky because this actually came out for you. We over in North America did not get Terra Enigma, which kind of sucks. But that said, you can reproduce it nowadays. You can, you know, import a copy if you've got a lot of money. And you absolutely should because this is a tremendous game. Especially if you like stuff like. Illusion of Guy and Soul Blazer because this is the final game in the series. Again, if we don't count the PS1 game, which I just remember the name of, the Grand Stream Saga. Still need to find a copy of that. Seriously, it's the only one in the set I don't have. But in addition to this being a very important import RPG, it also creates sort of a weird bit of my own collection because I have a North American copy of Illusion of Gaia, I have a Japanese Soul Blazer, and I have a reproduction of the European Terranigma. So I basically have the entire set across all the different regions because multiculturalism, I guess. 
Uh, but Terra Enigma is a great game. You start as like this troublemaker whose entire village kind of gets cursed by your own stupidity, and then you have to sort of sort out the world around you. And it's really interesting how they sort of build up the world around you. I, again, I don't like it quite as much as Illusion of Gaia, but this is a nice number two to the series, I think. Even though it's number three in terms of story, even though it's not connected to any of them in terms of story whatsoever. All right, next we have a game you should really have on the Genesis as opposed to the Super Nintendo. And I know not a lot of games can have that like proud like Medal of Honor, but we have Thunder Spirits. This is Thunder Force 3, except it's on the Super Nintendo. Um, this is vastly inferior to Thunder Force 3 on the Genesis in pretty much every way. First of all, that game had a stage select. Um, it had a soundtrack that was basically designed for the Genesis, whereas this one does not use the Genesis's abrasive sound chip. And because of that, you actually have a very sort of wimpy soundtrack. It, it's the same soundtrack, it just... The thing a lot of people like to attribute Super Nintendo games to being better than Genesis is the fact that the soundtrack is just better because the sound chips are better. And that is true unless the sound chip is made in mind for the game, such as the Thunder Force games. So to try and take that and put it to the softer, less abrasive Super Nintendo sound chip, it doesn't quite work as well. Uh, that said, it's still a Thunder Force game, which is great. It's a tremendous side-scrolling shooter. Uh, still not as good as the Genesis version. Just go get that version. But, um, you know, if you can't find a Genesis version, the Super Nintendo did get Thunder Spirits, I guess. Alright, next we have another absolute must-have import that unfortunately Europe got, we didn't. Uh, this is Twin B Rainbow Bell Adventures. I reviewed this back in the day. This is one of my earliest Super Famicom games. Um, actually, it might be my first Super Famicom game, honestly. And yeah, I think it actually is, thinking about it. Uh, this is a fantastic little Twin B platformer. In fact, it plays a lot like Rocket Knight Adventures, although the levels are a little bit more arcadey by design. Basically, you're just trying to find an exit point in this giant maze-like world. And it's a very, very fun little platformer. What's interesting is even though there is a PAL European copy of this, it's actually kind of functionally different and you want the Japanese copy because the Japanese copy had save files whereas the European version used uh, passwords and uh, this one had a stage select. Basically all the levels are mapped out on this giant map and you can pick your sort of order through going through the stages and find like secret routes to find alternate ways to go through the map whereas the European one it was a straight shot as I understand it. Um, so basically the Japanese version is superior in every way, but either way you are getting a tremendous platforming game. And not something you typically consider Twin B to have. Typically you just consider it to be a shmup, but this was one of the two weird sort of deviations from that. They also had an RPG on the PS1, and yes, that is in fact a thing. I don't have a copy though. Someday. Someday. Alright, next we have a game I am incredibly humble to own, thanks once again to my lovely girlfriend, is by our old pals Bips, we have the Twisted Tales of Spike McFang, by Bips. Uh, this is a fun little top-down adventure type of thing that makes you almost immediately think a link to the past, but it's not quite. Um, it's a very, very straightforward thing. It's a very arcadey, linear experience. There are a couple alternate paths you can take while adventuring through this game, However, they always end up leading to dead ends. Like, they wanted to have alternate routes, but they just didn't. Um, and another thing worth noting is, as fun and goofy as this game is, and it absolutely is, it is crushingly difficult. Health drops are really, really few and far between, level ups aren't terribly effective, and enemies are just ridiculously powerful, especially the bosses, and there's a reason for it. Uh, I didn't realize this at the time when I reviewed the game, but apparently, the reason why everything is so hard is actually because of localization. The localization team, for some reason, decided to monkey with all the numbers, so all the enemies have twice the stats, whereas you have half the stats. Uh, so even when you're on even terms with levels with the enemies, you are still at a huge disadvantage. And it's a damn shame, but this game is amazing. Uh, it starts out with you going to like fighting camp to try and learn how to be an actual fighter as opposed to just a vampire magician and like you're called away to try and help, which you turn down because you don't want your camp deposit to go to waste. Um, I, I don't know if that was actually like in the Japanese script or anything, but the localization team clearly had some fun with it. The plot in this game is just 
amazing. The sprite work tremendous. The soundtrack is just some of the best like lounge jazz you could ever hear. Like I, I've actually recorded a whole bunch of this game's soundtrack just to use for stuff like this, just because it's so damn good. Uh, unfortunately, I would also say this is probably the rarest and most obscure officially released Super Nintendo game in North America. I've only ever seen it ever brought up once, and that was on a website called RVG Fanatic, and that's actually where I learned about it. And uh, damn does this game need to more recognition, but unfortunately a typical cartridge of this will cost you like $250. It is a wildly expensive game. But um, my girlfriend got me a copy, and uh, this, this is really special for me to have. This is probably my most wanted SNES game, uh, right behind Run Saber. At least, you know, prior to me getting it, of course. Because once you get it, it's no longer wanted, because, you know, you got it. But still, great game. Very special. Really crushingly difficult, but a ton of fun. Here's a game that's not very fun, but I bought on concept alone, and it let me down so hard. We have UFO Common Yaki Soban. Uh, you play a ramen mascot who fights a guy named the Kettler, who is some kind of kettle-themed villain who's going to boil your ramen, I guess? Unfortunately, the soundtrack is terrible, the visuals are fairly bland, and there's only like two or three enemies, and punching them sucks. <laughs> I don't know how you make punching dudes boring, but this game did it, and that's with a ramen mascot. Like, fighting with ramen. You would think that is just such a dumb and completely insane concept that it has to be at least fun from a just completely random, odd Japanese sort of perspective, and no, it is bland and bad, and it makes me sad. It's a damn shame because this had every chance to be a really fun idea and it fumbled it really, really hard. All right, next we have a game called Versus Collection. This is a series of different games. I think I have a video of this out there, but it contains like a top-down snowball fight type of game. It's got like a puzzle game that I'm not very good at. It's got like a sort of faux Mario Kart style game. It's a mini game compilation basically where you play as these weird sort of alien penguin creatures. Um, not great, but it didn't cost me very much, and it's by Bottom Up, who I think I've heard of them once or twice, but I could not tell you where. Uh, otherwise, if you're not interested in minigame collections for your friends that you'll play for maybe 15 minutes total, I would probably skip this, but it was cheap, so there's that. And that is the next row of my collection of Super Nintendo and Super Famicom games. That's the last full row. However, we do have half a row more and uh, something else after that. So I will grab that and I will be right back. All right, kicking off the next chunk of the final row, we have Uchio Race Astro Gogo. -Go. I think I've got a footage of this up there. Um, I got this, I think, by looking at uh, the Game Facts page for. Uh, Battle Racers, the great battle racing game, and I think someone mentioned this as being like a fun racing game, and it's okay, it's sort of got like a three-quarter point of view to it, it's really awkward from what I remember, because you don't drive by like tilting left and right to like sort of angle your cart so much as you rotate it in place while like just boosting forward. I remember this game controlling really, really weird, but I guess we'll get a chance to figure it out when I record more footage for it. Uh, that said, it doesn't seem like the most common game ever, I've only seen one or two copies, but it doesn't seem like it's in high demand. Um, I believe this was originally going to be released in North America under like the name like Star Speedway Superstar or something insane like that, like it had a really dumb name, but it was at one point going to come out in North America as I understand it. And uh, it just didn't, but I also remember it controlling kind of awkwardly, so I'm not 100% torn up about it. But that said, if you're into racing games and you want to import something and you can find it for cheap, Astro Gogo -Go isn't the worst game you could find, for sure. Uh, that said, Versus Collection did have a really crappy kart racing-ish type thing, too. Alright, next we have a game I featured on my first loot video and was one of the reasons why I started doing all this. We have Undercover Cops. This is a ridiculously rare and expensive import beat em up. This is a repro cart that I got for free. Um, I was at a huge yard sale selling a bunch of games, including a ton of imports, and uh, you know that was that was the first video I ever made in this sort of series type of thing. And uh, there was someone else there that was just trying to buy everything else, and he, he was sort of like my at the sale kind of rival, if you can 
understand that concept. Like he was just grabbing all the cool stuff I wanted. I was probably grabbing all the cool stuff he wanted. Except he was trying to like desperately get ridiculously low prices from someone who was trying to give away basically his entire collection. And you know, I, I'm taking excellent care of the collection chunks I have from that. But uh, I think the seller just got so frustrated with someone just, you know, in his own way kind of belittling his collection that he got frustrated, took this out of his hands and just gave it to me. <laughs> so I got a free copy of Undercover Cops, which is ridiculously expensive and only available as an import. So. Uh, to get an English copy, that's that's pretty cool. It's a beat em up with a ton of like really cool details and really interesting special attacks. I'm awful at it, but I think it's a fun game. And for a game that cost me nothing and was a really fun memory, you know, you can't beat that. I, I think my copy of Undercover Cops is very, very special to me and I'm quite, quite happy I have a copy. It's very cool, I think. All right, moving on, we have Oh, I love this game, and I've got a full Let's Play, and a review, and a gameplay footage thing. We have Wagyan Paradise. Japanese edutainment at its finest, except you can pretty much play it entirely in English. Well, sort of. Um, basically, the Wagyan series, as I've shown before, is sort of edutainment, which is really hard to play if you can't understand Japanese. However, it's got some really fun platforming, and in this game it's got that same awesome platforming, as well as an even cooler, like really adorable, bright, colorful, sort of pastel art style. This is a very, very technically impressive looking game, and it's a lot of fun. That said, there's one or two areas that, like the boss battles involve reading, most of the boss battles involve like basic logic puzzles, like you have to create a square, so what are the missing shapes out of this main shape to create that square? Or, you know, match the colors or something like that. There's one or two that is reading, but if you set it to like kindergarten or grade or whatever, they give you enough lives that you can just brute force it, which I don't know how I feel about as an entertainment thing, because that kind of feels like it's defeating the purpose, but as a fun import, this thing is absolutely a game you need in your life. Uh, this made me want to get all the rest of the Wagyan games, and it's unfortunate because pretty much all the rest require you to be able to read, whereas this one you can kind of get by without. Uh, that said, if you're just going to get one Wagyan game, Paradise is it, because it's the most accessible and it's probably the most beautiful of the lot. This is just a fantastic little platformer with a really great cutesy style, and it, it's just a lot of fun. And I've got a full Let's Play if you want to see more and a review and all that. Go check all that stuff out because they're all awesome videos of a very awesome game. I believe this game is called Wedding Peach, I think. Uh, I got this in a bundle and I've honestly never played it. I think I looked it up once and like to put it on my digital list on GameFAQs. I think it was uh, Wedding Peach, um, but I can't tell you much more than that. Uh, that said, it was very, very cheap. It came in a bundle with a bunch of other games that I can't remember right off, but I know I didn't pay much for this because I wouldn't have, because I don't know what this is. I guess we'll find out as we go. It'll probably be like some visual novel thing that I will get stuck on immediately, and you can all have a laugh about that because I am unable to read Japanese to save my life. I can tell the visual difference between katakana and hiragana, but that is about it. All of my understanding of Japanese is purely audible, and even then I can only understand a few words, so... <laughs> I guess we'll figure out what this thing is. Alright, next we have... Ooh, this is a game I've been meaning to play, but I never got a chance. We have Wonder Project J. I actually got the sequel to this at said uh, garage sale way back when. But this is a point-and-click adventure slash, like, child-raising simulation, sort of. Basically, you have this kid who's a robot and you have to teach him how to do stuff, what's right, what's wrong, and have him solve like point and click puzzle adventure puzzles based on how you teach him. Uh, I haven't actually gotten a chance to play this yet. I got it as a bundle at the end of last year, but that said, I'm excited to give this a shot. And, uh, you know, I'll have footage of this when we're done, so there's that. And, you know, this game does have a translation and it was, uh, you know, found favorable enough to receive a sequel on the N64, so that's pretty cool. Uh, this is a game I've been meaning to play for a long time, so uh, now that I actually do have a copy, and I actually just unwrapped it from the wrapping I had it in from my purchase, like, just before I started this, like, that's that's how new I have this, so. You know, we're gonna get Wonder Project Day J a shot, and uh, I'm very, very excited for it, because I've heard nothing but good things about it. 
All right, we have Zardion by Asmic, and presumably other people. I know Asmic, though. They made Worm Journey to the Center of the Erath, spelled with a U. Uh, this is a platforming shooter featuring a bunch of different robots. You've got like a cat robot and like two different people robots. I got a gameplay video of it. I wasn't really on board with this game. I kind of figured I'd be... Again, honestly, I bought this because I thought it was Metal Warriors, and it wasn't. Seriously, someday I'm going to get a copy of Metal Warriors. But uh, Zardion, it really isn't that great. It's very, very anime, and it's, uh, you know, it's not bad. But I've played better platforming shooter games. But if you like mech platforming shooter games, this was available in North America. So you can track down a copy. And if you want a Japanese copy, it's not going to be very expensive. And, you know, the Super Nintendo is easily moddable to play Japanese games, so that's an option for you. That said, I'm not the biggest fan of Zardion, but it was a neat little pickup, and it's something I can talk about in the future. And I think I paid, like, 40 cents for it, so, you know. Alright, uh, this is a game that came out in English in Europe, and was really, really expensive. And in Japan, it's only kind of, sort of expensive. We have Xander no Daibo Ken. This is a spin-off of the Valkyrie Denset series, where you play as this guy, Xandra, who I think is some kind of kappa that uses like a little spear pitchfork to attack enemies. Uh, what's interesting is while there is an English version that was released in Europe, they modified the sprites. They, they sort of did like an American Kirby box art thing where the entire time he's just scowling and looking super pissed off for like no reason. Whereas in the Japanese version, he's just sort of a happy little guy. Uh, this game is kind of very, very beautiful. It sort of has a Wagyan land, sort of like pastel sort of look to it. It's very, very pretty, but it is crushingly difficult. I have never gotten past like the first two or three levels. This game is really unbelievably ridiculously hard. <laughs> But it was a lot of fun to give this game a shot, and it's a lot more affordable and easier to find in Japanese, although it's still pretty hard to find, and it's getting harder from what I can tell. That said, Xandra no Dai Boken, or, um, you know, Sandra's Adventures, or the English version I think was called Whirlo, it, uh, it exists. It's, it's not bad, but if you want to get better platformers, that's one to definitely consider. Alright, next is a, another Super Nintendo game I got kind of around my second tour of college for Christmas. I got Excalibur 2097 as my cat sneezes and makes a whole bunch of noise because he needs to sit in a sink for some reason. Um, I reviewed this back in the day. It is sort of a subpar hacky slashy platformer. The second boss has like a ridiculous guard and can reach twice your reach, so there's no way to really defeat him without cheating. <laughs> it's it's a really hard platformer. It has some cool moments, like an entire building like falling apart as you run across it, but I just remember this game being really, really hard. That said, I remember looking at the sprite style before this game, uh, before I got this game and thinking, you know, without looking at video, it looked really, really cool and I had to have a copy. And I got a copy, and it's not very good. But that said, it's another game to review, and I did. And I'm gonna get footage for it, and it's part of my collection, and I love it, even if it's not that great. Also, Fast Mini Mart, because I guess Fast Mini Mart. Yeah. All right, and next we have, this is another game that came with Arrow the Acrobat, Young Merlin. This was on my poop game of the year list at the time I got it, and it sucks that it had to be because it started off pretty cool. You start out, as this kid just trying to rescue this girl, you wake up in a field and you have to like go fight these little gnomes. You get like this little freezing powder and you get to like destroy little plants. It's all cute and happy. And then about five minutes later, you're like in this terrible cave with this stupid minecart system that will instantly kill you. And you have to navigate it by like surfing on it. And you don't get second chances and you die instantly and have to do it over. And it's just frustrating. And what's even worse, that's not the only time you have to do it, and that's the short one. There's a much, 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 much longer one. Otherwise, it's a neat little top-down, goofy little adventure game, but it kind of stops being cute and fun after the first 10 minutes and just becomes, like, crushingly difficult and feels like the people who made it just absolutely hate you. And it sucks, because it starts out really fun. But, um, yeah, that's, that's a game I own. And this is the last loose cart we have. 
we have Zombies Ate My Neighbors. All right, this is a weird game because Near as I can tell, this is an uncommon and weird game that no one had, and yet I think it's a regional thing, because growing up here, everyone had this game. It was like a phenomenon. I got my original copy at a cash converter as well after that, because again, I was poor and my family never wanted me to have games, but uh, this is a great top-down shooter where you have to rescue all the civilians from zombies and stuff and all sorts of monsters. It has a fantastically fun soundtrack, a goofy aesthetic, terrifying moments, seriously, the music for like the second or third level where you run into like the Chainsaw Jason Voorhees guys, still pants-wettingly scary music, uh, really tough enemies, ridiculously difficult in terms of gameplay, and it has some really, really cool secret areas, including references to Day of the Tentacle, as well as a secret weapon that took years for people to find in a flamethrower. Yeah. This, this game is pretty cool, and it has tons of goofy weapons like silverware and like dishes and squirt guns filled with holy water, and every single the, one of those weapons is super effective against something else. Like the more obvious example I can give you is the silverware happens to be really effective against the werewolves instantly killing them, which is really, really cute. It is a game by LucasArts back when they were existent, which makes me sad to think what, you know, is happening with everything they did nowadays. Oh, I miss LucasArts, don't you? But uh, this was kind of something amazing that they made. Uh, there was a sequel, although it didn't start life as a sequel. It's called Ghoul Patrol, it's not very good. There was also a game that didn't start as a sequel, but actually is basically a sequel called Herc's Adventure. I've never played either, but I hear the second one of the two is a lot better. I was thinking sequel, but then I said second, you know how it is. Uh, anyway, Zombies Ate My Neighbors. This game was very special. I bought it as part of a Halloween Let's Play I was going to do. I bought three copies. None of them worked. I finally got a fourth that worked, and of course, wouldn't you know it, I got it at my doorstep November 1st. So I had to wait a whole year to do it. <laughs> But I had this game when I was a kid, so getting to play it again was a lot of fun. And this is an absolute must-have if you like arcade shooters. And it's got a great co-op system that is at the same time kind of counter-op. Very, very cool. Now, like I said, that is it for the standalone cartridges. But now i got a couple boxed games. And I'm just going to put this stuff away, clean off my table, and we'll get back with that in a sec. All right, now we got some boxed Super Famicom games. These are very cool. Uh, we're starting this off with good old Final Fantasy V, the second greatest Final Fantasy game ever made. I'm sure lots of people will argue that, but uh, I won't. This is the one we never got, and it's a shame because it's a very fun one. It's a lot more lighthearted than your other Final Fantasies on the system, but I think it's very, very cool. Uh, it introduced class changes basically on the fly. It introduced blue mages, which when you first look at blue mages, you might think they're just ridiculously stupid. Blue mages are like the most badass class of all time, just depending on how well you understand the numbers and how the game works. For example, if you ignore every single fight, except for a tutorial fight against a goblin in the first city, just to learn its ability as a blue mage, and then avoid every single fight up to the first boss, you can kill it in one turn. Just because his level will match your level, and that means Goblin Punch, the move you get from the Goblin, will do like five times damage. And then if you level up to like level three, and then avoid every fight up to the second boss, you can take him out in one turn. Blue Mages are ridiculously situational, but they are some of the most fun classes you could ever play as. I remember playing Final Fantasy Tactics Advance and first seeing the Blue Mage and saying, that is the stupidest, most sucky class I've ever heard of. And then I played this, and it is just, oh, it's, it's the best class ever. Uh, for, for further reference for how awesome Blue Mages are, because I'll be here forever just gushing over how great they are, uh, check out a podcast by the name of Turtles Paradise. They did uh, four episodes on how great the Blue Mage is, just reviewing Final Fantasy IV, basically. Um, that is a great podcast for Final Fantasy fans, and it is really indicative of how great Final Fantasy V can actually be. I know a lot of people don't like it, but I think it's definitely my favorite one that we didn't get, certainly. Uh, it's not going to be Final Fantasy VI anytime soon, but it comes damn close. I'm not the biggest, you know, PS1 Final Fantasy fan, but I love Final Fantasy V. And it has one of my favorite characters of all time, Captain Farris. 
and it's just it's it's a great game it's an inverse of a lot of adventure games as well because you know a lot of adventure games you're a guy saving a princess or whatever well this game basically ends with three princesses and a guy so it, it's kind of interesting i i love this game i'm sad that we never got it in north america on the super nintendo we did get it on the ps1 and we did get it on the uh game boy advance i really got to get a game boy advance copy of this but uh Damn, I love Final Fantasy V. It's such a good game. All right, next we have another one of my all-time favorite imports for the system. We have a game called Marvelous, featuring these three guys, who are now probably most famous for being a spirit in Smash Bros. Ultimate. Uh, Max, Dion, and Jack. Uh, the best way I can describe this game is sort of like A Link to the Past, except there's, like, no combat. Excuse me. Um... It's really just a big adventuring puzzle game. You go around like disarming traps and solving puzzles using all these different items you get and solving mysteries and it's... Uh, this game is so good. I've got a full review of it and I really have to uh, play this again, but... I believe there was a Satellivision sequel to this, which of course we never got because Satellivision... or Satellivision, Satellaview. And uh, that's damn shame. But there's like this really cool sort of like uh, first person mode where you can go in depth and look at stuff and like interact with stuff. Uh, it's, it's just a really great adventuring puzzle game. This is like an Indiana Jones game if it was a top down adventure aimed at kids. And if you want a fun import and you don't mind applying a translation patch or you know a lot of Japanese, get this game because this game is really one of the coolest SFC um, imports I've gotten because uh, Marvelous it's very true to its name and I've got a giant review of it that you can go watch as well I kind of mentioned this game earlier sort of when I brought up Live Alive but we have Romancing Saga uh, this is a game that taught me how little I like the Saga series <laughs> uh, and, and they're being remade on the Xbox One which confuses me but I picked like all these different characters have different stories and like they all converge at the end allegedly but I get, I'd never played all the way through it but I picked one character and I played for about eight hours straight going to every single area of the game and bear in mind this is with a translation patch so I'm not just bumbling around going through text boxes hoping someone will just sort of let me through or whatever no this is me trying to understand everything and I could not find a single fight in this game nor could I find any semblance of plot like, I, I just did not find the thing to trigger plot. Like, that's the thing. This is a very... A lot of people complain about games being too hand-holdy. Play this game. This is the anti-hand-holding game, which could be good for some people, but I at least like a general direction I can go in when I start. Because, you know, if I don't have a general direction, I will just bumble around. And that game doesn't seem to have random fights. It just has pre-scripted fights that I could not run into any of. Alright, next we have a game that I think everyone can, you know, agree is pretty good. We have Super Bomberman 2. I got this at that awesome garage sale back when. And, uh, you know, it's it's Super Bomberman. I think we can all agree it's pretty good. Um, I'm not a big fan of the Super Bomberman games. I, I know, you know, hate me all you like, but I like the N64 games that were adventure games as opposed to these more arcadey Bomberman games. They're just not really my jam. I like the adventure ones. But that said, it's an amazing game, and it's a fun party game if that's what you're into. Alright, so let's let's follow that up with good old Super Bomberman 3. Introducing Louis, I believe. This was, or at the very least, it had them because they're on the cover. And that is all I'm going to commit to that statement. Uh, it's the sequel to Super Bomberman 2. It's the third one. This one we never got. We got the first two, but that was it, I believe. Uh, this one we never got, nor the other two, but that said, it's more Super Bomberman. It's the same goodness you've come to expect from Super and Bomberman. But again, it's not really an adventure Bomberman, so it's not something that holds my interest a ton, but it's great that I've got a copy of it. And the fact that it's boxed means all the more to me. And of course, we have to continue that with Super Bomberman 4. What else can I say? It's more Super Bomberman. The great thing is, again, at that garage sale, I got all three of these for, like, maybe $4. Uh, the, the guy selling it just, he was super nice to me, and he was just throwing stuff in left, right, and center for basically nothing, and I really respect it because it really helped set up our coffers with imports. 
Um, but Super Bomberman 4, it's a great game, but again, it's more Super Bomberman. And if you're not into the arcade Super Bombermans, it's not going to be as entirely up your alley. But if you like multiplayer or you like Super Bomberman or you like the arcade Bombermans, this one's going to be pretty good because it's more of the same. All right, now we're getting into something I can really get behind. Super Donkey Kong, also known as Donkey Kong Country. This is a big important game for me because, as I've said countless times, my family hated video games. But Donkey Kong Country, along with its sequels, were the only time my mom would ever sit down and play video games with me. It was the only time she ever really spent time with me. So I rented the crap out of Donkey Kong Country, just hoping she'd come play with me because it was like the only time we ever really connected. Um, again, my family just didn't really like games or spending time with me. So, uh, I've played a lot of Donkey Kong Country. That said, I don't think this is really my favorite in the series. I think it's kind of the weakest of the lot. But it's an amazing game, and it's a really, really groundbreaking game because this was like the first fully rendered game of all time. As far as I know, it's certainly like the most famous one. And, uh, you know, this was rare doing what they did best. And I still say the Donkey Kong Country games are rare at their best. I mean, it's certainly not whatever it is they're doing now. Let's follow that up with Super Donkey Kong 2, Dixie and Diddy. This is basically Donkey Kong Country, except they added a 2, and they added the greatest Kong of all time, Dixie, because she flies. Um, I just love that these games are so thematically interwoven together. Like, at the end of the first game, spoilers, you fight King K. Rule on a ship. Well, the next game, He's this pirate captain, like it's it's an allusion to his next persona, so to speak. And the whole game is more pirate themed, you're invading their island as opposed to them invading yours. In fact, if I recall, you end up sort of taking the boat they left at the end of the previous game to go to their island. And you know, the first whole area is just you clearing out all the bad guys from it. Uh, this game has some of the best soundtrack on the Super Nintendo, it is also really, really hard. But damn if it's fun. I know a lot of people like to say this is the best one, and depending on what day you ask me, I kind of agree, but I kind of disagree. But uh, I think we can all agree it's a tremendous soundtrack, and it's an awesome, awesome game. And of course, we got to finish the trilogy off with DKC3. I don't know what the Japanese name for this one was, but it added Kitty Kong, which... Bleh. Like, Kitty Kong is not that cool. Like, I don't think Donkey Kong is particularly cool. I think he's kind of like the lamest character in his own series. Certainly the DKC games. But Kitty is, um, he's rough. But you got more Dixie, so play as Dixie because she's amazing. Uh, this time, you are chasing King K. Rule, who was previously fought in a, uh, giant flying contraption. Except now he's some kind of mad scientist. Sure. Uh, it's now in basically an allusion to the DKC equivalent of Canada, which is like the Northern Hemisphere, which is a lot colder, there's a lot more ice. I don't care for that so much. Um, the soundtrack has probably my favorite song in the entire series on it, and it's got some of my favorite levels, but I know a lot of people like to dump on this game, and I don't agree. Again, depending on what day, this might be my favorite in the series, but I gotta say, it is one of the most technically impressive Super Nintendo games I've ever seen. Yes, it's probably doing far more than it should, and it's to its detriment, but it's still damn impressive, and it's still a fantabulous game. I love that game a lot. Alright, next we have Super Wagon Land. It's like the NES Wagon Land games, except even more hard, even more edutainment-y, and requiring even more Japanese reading ability. Oh dear lord, we're doomed. Uh, if I recall, there's mosaic tile puzzle levels that where you have to, like, yeah, like right there, where you have to just sort of, uh, hold on, let's, let's, let's get that in there. Yeah, you gotta like decipher what this mosaic tile puzzle is, and it's like basically impossible if you can read Japan, if you can read Japan, if you can read Japanese, but uh, even if you can't, you're just doomed. <laughs> like, these are basically unplayable, which sucks because Wagon Paradise was so good. And then we've got... Super Wagon Land 2. I'm really sad that Wagon Paradise, you know, the best one is the one I don't have boxed, but uh, in fact, it's the only Wagon game I have that isn't boxed. Well, that's sad because that was the best one. Uh, anyway, it's the sequel to this one. So it's going to be more Wagons, more power, and more goodness if you can read Japanese and are up for entertaining yourself. 
I'll stick with Wagon Paradise, thank you, because that's a little bit more accessible to me, but uh, yeah, pretty good game, pretty good game. All right, next we have this game. This I bought when I finally started buying Super Nintendo games for myself in high school. Uh, we have Space Invaders. Now, the thing you have to understand about me is I don't really care about Space Invaders. I, I know it's a very important game, I just, it's not a game that interests me. But this, along with Donkey Kong Country, was the only other game my mom ever liked. So I bought this thinking, you know, maybe she'd want to come, you know, reminisce and play Super Nintendo with me, and uh, she never played it. And I played it once or twice, but it's, it's Space Invaders, I don't really care all that much. It's historically important, but it's just not something that interests me. And now we move on to the last game. And going back to the start of the previous episode, when I showed a picture of my entire collection, you might have noticed a Super Nintendo game facing outward, not lying on its side, just, you know, out there for display, unlike the rest. And there's a good reason for that. It was because this game means so much to me that it has to be out in display like that. This is the secret of mana. This is my favorite game of all time. It is not a perfect game. It is a game that I believe something like 80% of it was axed both during translation and because this was originally going to be the very first game on the Sony made CD system for the Super Nintendo that eventually got axed and they had to cut all of the stuff from it just to fit it on a cartridge and then it further got like 80% of all dialogue axed from the game just so it could fit in North American translations. This is a game where halfway through the game the plot stops happening and they just tell you to go follow a guy who went to a place maybe. This is a game that is very much not the best game ever. It's got awkward like AI patterns, it's got terrible pathfinding, it's got a lot of really terrible things about it. But you know what this does have? Something very meaningful to me. See, I love RPGs. It is my single favorite genre of all time. And yet, that was not always the case. You see, I actually hated RPGs, kind of. I loved games that had a ton of great story like RPGs, but at the same time, I hated having to level, I hated having to grind, I hated the concept that I would lose to an enemy just because their numbers were bigger than mine. Just because numbers were better. I hated that. And that's because I didn't want to fight enemies. I wanted to run, I wanted to experience the story, I wanted to explore this awesome world, find treasure, have an adventure, not necessarily like slowly fight enemies. So I would always, always, always be under leveled. Final Fantasy, Chrono Trigger, you name it, I couldn't do it. And I hated it because of it. Because I knew there was something awesome there, but it just wasn't clicking for me because I was so impatient. Secret of Mana was an action RPG. It was a game where, theoretically, you could avoid every single enemy attack and just counter and take your opponent out regardless of their numbers because you were more effective a fighter than them. At least that's what I thought at the time. This is still very much a game about numbers because enemies have basically 100% accuracy. But this game taught me the concept of an action RPG. It taught me that it doesn't have to be about numbers. This taught me that there were RPGs that could really appeal to me. And that would continue on with stuff like Illusion of Gaia. But this was the game that did it for me. This was the game that turned me onto my single favorite genre of all time. And it's one of the most beautiful soundtracks of all time, one of the most beautiful games of all time. Yes, it's got a ton of problems, but there's only one secret of mana. Unless you get the remake, which let's not talk about that. But this is my most favorite game of all time. So this box always faces outwards as respect and as a sign of all the memories and what this game represents to me. It's a very special game to me and it's very important. This was a Christmas present during my senior year? Yeah, senior year of high school by my mom. And uh, this, to this day, stands to being the greatest present I have ever received. There's been one or two that came close. She got me Skies of Arcadia one year for Christmas. My brother got me an NES Classic at one point. But um, nothing has ever topped the secret of mana. Anyway, that has been my entire Super Nintendo collection. I hope you all enjoyed. And if you did, subscribe to the channel to show me more. To show me more. To see more. You can see I've been doing this for about 
two weeks of all-nighters just recording all this. <laughs> I apologize for how incoherent this has gotten, but uh, I'm very tired. Um, you know, comment in the whole comment section about your collection, your favorite Super Nintendo games, what you like from mine. You know, check out the show's PayPal or Patreon support show any way you can so that I can continue to do what I do best, which is show you what I have. I mean, if you want to trade games, if you want to donate games, you know, I will gladly add your games to my collection to make it an even better collection so that we can all share this thing together. If you want to, you know, comment and tell me all these different amazing games for the system I don't know about, because I know there's quite a few I don't know about, let me know. But this has been my Super Nintendo and Super Famicom collection. I hope that this has been informative, entertaining, and something you enjoy. This is very, very personal to me. This is the definition of why I wanted to do this whole thing as a series for having so many subscribers. I wanted to make this a very personal thing that brought me, this guy right here on the other side of the camera, up to you. And I cannot think of a more personal thing than my Super Nintendo collection. And more importantly, my favorite game of all time. I hope you all enjoyed, and I will see you next time, which will be N64 games. And more of my amazing collection, and more of my greatest passion brought to you from me with love. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed, and I'll see you next time. Peace out, Internet. <laughs>